All right, good, af good afternoon, everyone. We're gonna get started with today's uh, special policy session of the Phoenix uh, City Council. I appreciate everyone being here, and we're gonna try to, a lot of people here, a lot of people to provide information to uh, myself and the council members and to our executive staff, including the aviation staff, uh, on issues relative to overflights in our neighborhood, particularly historic neighborhoods in the central part of the, uh, of the city. So we're gonna get started in uh, just a moment. Before uh, we begin our discussion today, I just wanted to address an issue that uh, will be on tomorrow's uh, agenda, but I wanted to be fair to let the community and my members of the, of the council know. Uh, so very shortly, I just wanna speak on an issue that is important uh, to all of us. And that is the issue of the relationship between our police officers, the community, and particular people of color in our community. A great deal has happened across the country over the last few weeks and months that remind us all that for all the progress we have made as a nation when it comes to race issues, there is still much work to do. We have a long way to go. And our city and our community is not immune from this reality. We do things better than most, but we need to continue to have an important discussion about how we can break down barriers and how we can build an even stronger relationship between our police department and every person that our department serves. Almost four years ago, many of the members of the council were on the council at that time, uh, a key task force was created, the Community Engagement and, and Outreach uh, Task Force, a task force made up of community and faith leaders, law enforcement, city leadership, uh, and made a, a set of well thought out recommendations for increasing resident access to and confidence in the Phoenix Police Department. Still, four years later, not all of those recommendations have been fully uh, implemented. I'm concerned about that. Councilman Ke Kate Gallego has addressed this issue with me. She's told me that she's very concerned about it as well. And I'm I appreciate how dedicated Councilman Gallego and many others on our council is to the proposition that we can do better and foster a stronger relationship between everyone in our community with the police department. So tomorrow, she and I will be asking our colleagues to direct our city manager to provide us with a status update, where we are with those issues, those recommendations, so that we have up-to-date and accurate information. Provide that report to the Public Safety Subcommittee first, and then to the full council by the end of uh, January. Again, there's a lot of work to do. We don't have all of the answers, but I hope that we can all agree that we can do uh, better, and that the current status quo uh, is not acceptable to, um, to us. And so that, that item, uh, I think the city manager will be an add-on on, on tomorrow's uh, agenda. I wanted to kind of address the reasons why we're adding that item on to tomorrow's agenda. All right, the item on today's agenda uh, is- Mayor, Mayor, can I make a statement too about our police department? You, you may certainly might go ahead. And I appreciate your comments on that, but our police department's under fire right now. They've done everything right, and I think it's also a good thing for us to be able to say publicly that we support our police department, we su support the men and women in blue, we understand the sacrifices that they go through and how difficult their lives are. And the fact of the matter is, we need to have a strong statement coming from this city that says we support them. And I fully support our police department. I understand all the issues that are going on, but at the same time, we need to have a strong statement supporting the people that support us and that protect us on a daily basis. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Councilman. Uh, Councilman, uh, uh, one thought foremost, it, it, so this is more information to the uh, city manager, councilman. Thank you, I just wanted to respond to that as well. I think it is simultaneously possible to believe two things, that it is the responsibility of the city council and law enforcement to take immediate and concrete steps to address legitimate concerns raised by the community, but also to believe that our law enforcement are incredibly important, that they provide the ultimate example of public service, and that we do need to appreciate they wor the work they do while moving forward with this dialogue. So appreciate the mayor working with all of us on this important issue, and I'm looking forward to tomorrow and the future public Excellent. safety. Yeah, there's gonna be a large crowd tomorrow as well, I'm sure providing very important information to this council, and I appreciate the comments of both council members, and uh, we'll have Mayor, a healthy, have a healthy discussion. Cou Councilman, please. Mayor, as the chair of the um, public safety subcommittee, I like staff to actually look into releasing police officers' names prior to them being convicted or actually going through some type of evaluation to see what happened. I mean, we need to talk about the safety of our officers and also the family members. So I think we need to have some type of protocol or some type of um, system that when we release those names of those individuals, right? Thank you very much. Okay, so the, the uh, item on today's agenda is Federal Aviation Administration changes in aircraft flight path at Phoenix 
uh, Sky Harbor uh, Airport. Uh, my proposal, how we move forward with this item today, is to hear from our professional staff first. Uh, I do believe we have a representative of the FAA who is here as well who would like to provide a statement to the mayor and, uh, and council. So that'll be part of the presentation uh, by, uh, uh, by professionals, both from city and from the federal government, uh, and then have council members uh, five minutes, up to five minutes each, to ask questions on those issues. Then we'll hear from the community. I know there's a lot of cards of people who want to provide information, testimony, too. I think there's some people holding them up, so I think some cards still have to be collected, so someone will please collect those. Uh, and then uh, we'll turn it back to um, uh, uh, Mayor and Council and, and, and a motion if anybody has one on the proposed action items here uh, today. Does anyone disagree with that way of approaching things? Um, and I will, uh, no, I'm gonna ask the vice mayor. You're the timekeeper. I'll give you my watch, Brian. All right. All right, good. All right, so without further, uh, uh, further ado, Mr. City Manager, I'll let you kick it off, please. Thank you, Mayor and members of the City Council. Uh, we are here today, as the Mayor said, at your request to discuss how to move forward given the changes in departure procedures at Phoenix Sky Harbor International Airport that are affecting the community. Phoenix Sky Harbor is one of the state's largest economic engines, and it also needs to be a good neighbor. And we work hard at that every day at the City of Phoenix. This has been a challenging three months for everyone affected by the new Western departure procedures at Sky Harbor. As we work to establish how we move forward, city staff are paying close attention to your voice as you have expressed the community's concerns. The change departure surprised you in the community. I assure you that city staff will do everything possible to make sure that does not happen again. We know that we in the FAA could have done better in this process and you have our pledge on the city side that we will do better, and it's our expectation that the FAA will do better as well. As you'll hear from Acting Aviation Director Tammy Fisher, going forward we will verify all information we get from the FAA about arrival and departure procedures, and we will work the Phoenix way in collaboration and conversation with you and the community. So I'll now turn the mic over to Deputy City Manager Lisa Takata, who will begin our presentation. Good afternoon, Mayor and members of Council. Thank you for the opportunity to share the information that we have for you today in this briefing. Our pathway forward from here relies very heavily on clear communication and information sharing to inform the difficult decision process that lies ahead. We are committed to that as a city. We would ask our FAA representatives who are here at the table with us to join us in that effort as we move forward. It's my pleasure today to introduce Tammy Fisher, who is our Acting Aviation Director. To her right is Glenn Martin, the Regional FAA Administrator, who will be included in the presentation. And then Chad Makovsky, our Assistant Aviation Director. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mayor and City Council members. I also want to thank you for the opportunity to be here today to discuss the flight path changes recently implemented at Phoenix Sky Harbor Airport. I've personally heard the concerns from individual city council members and from community members that the flight path changes have had a tremendous impact on Phoenix residents. The flight path changes came as a surprise to you and to the community, and that's not okay. That's not the way we do things in Phoenix, and I'll make sure that that won't happen again. Phoenix Aviation staff takes a lot of pride in the collaborative relationship that we've built with the FAA and our airline business partners. We relied on the AF FAA's experience and trusted the strong communication channels that we've worked hard to develop over the years. Given our well-developed relationship, we expected that these changes would be implemented, as Mr. Zerker said, the Phoenix way through collaboration and good public communication and that's not how it was done, and I'll make sure that that doesn't happen again. Mayor and Council, I assure you that moving forward, the aviation team in Phoenix will insist on a public dialogue and collaboration for any changes that the FAA may propose. We'll establish tighter controls on monitoring the activity of our federal partners to identify red flags and protect our community and we'll advocate for the FAA to keep a high priority on this issue and report back on the measures that they could um, implement to relieve noise for our community. What we're talking about today is really a shared responsibility between industry stakeholders as we provide air transportation to the public. 
The Federal Aviation Administration has sole authority to control air traffic and safety and efficiency are at the core of their mission. The City of Phoenix, through its Aviation Department, owns, operates, and maintains the airport, and we provide noise monitoring and information to the public about noise concerns as a result of airport operations. And finally, the airlines conduct their business at the airport, operating flights to and from the airport, providing air transportation to the public. The FAA is in the process of implementing an initiative called Next Generation Air Transportation System, or NextGen, in major metropolitan areas all across the country. The goal of the initiative is to improve safety and efficiency of air traffic management. A major component of NextGen is the implementation of new satellite procedures rather than using traditional land-based navigation aids. This is called RNAV. Aircraft equipped with appropriate flight management systems use GPS to fly predetermined routes with improved precision. It's important to know that not all aircraft are equipped with satellite technology for navigation, and so some are still using old navigation technology. Again, the new navigation procedures are now are expected to improve safety and efficiency, uh, reducing fuel, fuel consumption and emissions. In Phoenix, the new RNAV procedures were implemented for arrivals in 2006. The recent flight path changes implemented on September 18th of this year were for departures, and the four arrival procedures were, there were adjustments made to those arrival procedures to coordinate with the departure, the new departure procedures. In September of 2013, last year, the FAA completed an initial environmental review of the proposed flight changes in accordance with the National Environmental Policy Act, or NEPA. As part of that process, the FAA consulted with the Arizona State Historic Preservation Office. At that time, the State Historic Preservation Officer concurred with the FAA's finding of no adverse impact. Yesterday, the State Historic Preservation Office sent a letter to the FAA requesting that they reopen the matter and reevaluate the impacts to historic properties. In March of 2014, um, the design of the new, as the design of the new procedures evolved, the FAA reevaluated uh, their finding of no adverse impact and upheld their finding of uh, no impact and proceeded under a categorical exclusion where no additional environmental review was necessary and um, there was no public notification. On September 18th, the FAA activated the new um, RNAV flight procedures at Sky Harbor. This is an example of the flight path data that the FAA provided to aviation staff. It's called a departure plate. There are, this is uh, based on technical data um, with some uh, highway and, and major transportation corridors shown underneath, but this is mostly the type of information that an air traffic controller or a technical industry professional might look at. This particular procedure um, is a standard instrument departure, or a SID, and each one of them is named, this one is named Yotes. The, this plate was created by the FAA on April 5th, 2012, and it was transmitted to the aviation staff on August 17, 2012. These plates were produced and transmitted to aviation staff at various times during the evolution of designing the new flight path procedures, 13 uh, total procedures, nine departures, and four arrivals. When our staff receives that information, they convert it to a map that shows more underlying geography using the City of Phoenix uh, geographic information system. And then they use uh, their access through a contractor to FAA radar flight data to layer on historic flight activity so that we can see the comparison between the um, new uh, proposed flight path procedure and the historic flight tracks. Staff presented this type of map to aviation management for the first time in September 2013. It's at this point that the Phoenix aviation team and management staff should have inquired more 
about the environmental analysis that went into this process and the FAA's plans for, to communicate these new procedures publicly to the community. Based on our knowledge of noise impacts around the airport, aviation staff did not expect new noise impacts as a result of the flight path changes. Aviation technical staff continued to work with FAA local air traffic control staff on technical operational as in aspects of the project. Since the implementation of the new procedures, we have received over 1,700 complaints from over 500 households impacted by the new departure changes. Over 1,700 complaints in a matter of 90 days is truly remarkable when you consider that last year for the entire year of 2013, for the entire city, we received 221 complaints from 43 households. We're approaching an order of magnitude difference. All of the complaints are logged and transmitted to the FAA. We've personally returned calls to each household and will continue to do so. We've provided FAA contact information on our website, skyharbor.com, and we also have always and will continue to produce uh, a monthly noise information report that's also located on our website. And now, Mayor and Council, I'll turn the presentation over to the FAA Regional Administrator, Glenn Martin. Good afternoon, Mr. Mayor, Council members. Thank you for the opportunity to be here as well. At the October 16th public meeting, the FAA committed to review the new advanced navigation procedures that were implemented for Sky Harbor International Airport on September 18th. Since that listening session, we have also received additional feedback from many residents, community leaders, and elected officials. We are committed to partnering with the Phoenix Department of Aviation to explore adjustments that could potentially address the concerns, as well as communicating the status of our review to the community. Our data analysis has included the comments received at the listening session. We have also received numerous letters and emails, and the Department of Aviation has forwarded some ideas as well. On November 13th, we attended a collaborative meeting with the De Phoenix Department of Aviation and airline representatives. During this meeting, we discussed the concerns raised during the listening session and the other input that we had received. Since implementation, we determined that some aircraft were not flying the new procedures as intended. In response, the agency has taken steps to ensure more aircraft are flying the procedures as designed. In partnership with Phoenix Department of Aviation as well as industry representatives, we plan to continue our public outreach. This outreach may include explaining how the procedures were designed, the benefits that we are all receiving for them, and progress made to date on our analysis of possible future adjustments. We plan to begin this outreach in January. Currently, our efforts in response to the community concerns include establishing an initial set of data for the new procedures for which will be used for future comparisons. We are also reviewing the various input and suggestions we received, and we will model to see whether the adjustments could address community concerns. Adjustments might include adjusting the altitudes or departure speeds and whether waypoint changes on the published route would reduce the impacts. The FAA will con also consider any adjustment the airport asks us to look at. It is important to understand that any possible changes would then need to be reviewed from a safety, environmental, and legal perspective. We plan to have our analysis completed in the spring. Thank you again for the opportunity to be here today, and please be assured the FAA will continue to keep you informed moving forward. Thank Go you, ahead. Mr. Martin. Thank you very much, Tammy, please. For reference, I'd like to show a few maps that um, indicate activity and um, other information about the new departures. This particular map shows the departures for about a two-week period prior to the implementation of the new procedures. Um, the airport is located in the middle of this map indicated by the PHX, and each of the blue lines indicates a departing flight uh, from Sky Harbor before the procedures were uh, implemented. This is a fairly large area, about 25 miles by 25 miles, so it's really a pretty big picture of the entire city. And you can see that these flight path corridors are fairly wide. This is the same period of time with the green lines indicating each departure 
from Sky Harbor over about a two week period after the new departures were implemented. And you can immediately see that the flight uh, paths here are much narrower, particularly closer into the airport. This map shows the comparison of the old and the new departure procedures. Because of the more narrow flight paths, the FAA indicated that they expected fewer residents to have aircraft flying directly over their homes. However, some households, a smaller number, would have more aircraft overhead. This is a land use map of the area um, and of the airport and the area to the west for the west departures. Uh, Grand Avenue is highlighted on the diagonal there with the dark uh, line. The dark pink areas on this map indicate industrial use, and the lighter pink areas indicate commercial use. The yellow or light tan areas generally indicate single family residential, and the red crosshatch areas show land use that has a historic overlay. The FAA viewed the departure route primarily on the southwest side of Grand Avenue to be over an industrial area and concluded that there would be little to no impact to the community. <laughs> Mayor and Council, as you know, city staff facilitated a large community meeting with the FAA on October 16th to hear the community's concerns about the impact of these new flight uh, procedures. As Mr. Martin just mentioned, at the conclusion of the meeting, uh, FAA Regional Administrator Glenn Martin committed to providing the airport with a response to the community concerns within 30 days, which he did through a letter to me on November 14th. In that letter, Mr. Martin indicated that the new procedures may not have been flown as they were intended and that the local air traffic controllers in Phoenix had been instructed not to allow early turns. Some people didn't understand what that meant. So this map is intended to show um, the flight procedures departing from Sky Harbor and heading up the Grand Avenue corridor uh, before that no early turn directive was given. You can see at the top left side of the screen how those uh, flight paths veer off the Grand Avenue corridor to the north and then headed to the east. After the no early turn directive, you can see there are much fewer, although not entirely gone, there are fewer uh, early turns coming off that Grand Avenue corridor and heading to the east early. Mayor and Council, in addition to all the great work that you have been doing communicating at the federal level in the last 60 days with calls and letters, there's also been much activity at the federal level. A joint letter to FAA Administrator Michael Huerta was sent from Democratic Congressman Ed Pastor and Republican Congressman Tom Latham of Iowa, along with senior members of the House Appropriations Committee, which sets policy on appropriations of federal funds to agencies. Staff recommends continued engagement with the House and Senate Appropriations Committee on this issue. Our Phoenix Airport, uh, rep Washington DC representative also met with senior construct congressional staff regarding community concerns about the new flight paths. And also Assistant Aviation Director Chad Makovsky here with us today met with a senior FAA uh, official who is responsible for establishing flight paths at FAA headquarters in Washington DC. And finally in the recently approved 2015 federal uh, appropriations bill languages included requiring the FAA to update Congress within 90 days of passing the bill on the departure route mitigation measures specific to Phoenix Sky Harbor. Here's the summary of the language that was included in the bill um, asking the FAA to identify and pursue appropriate mitigation measures for the specific noise concerns and flight path procedures in Phoenix. Um, make sure that the new flight procedures are being flown as intended and that the procedures are adhered to. And then to come back to the Senate and House Appropriations Committee members within 90 days of the enactment of the act to present a progress report on how this issue is being addressed in Phoenix. We certainly support the bill and recommend ongoing collaboration with FAA as they fulfill the requirements of the bill uh, to update to update the um, House and Senate committees.
We'll also be providing a monthly update to the Downtown Aviation and Redevelopment Subcommittee at the request of Chairman Valenzuela and the other subcommittee members, as well as updates to the full City Council. Staff recommends holding a series of community meetings in January to respond to community questions and to continue to document their concerns. We also want to hear suggestions from the community about how aviation staff can provide them with more information or additional information and technical resources. We also want to get the community's input on where our consultant could place temporary noise monitoring equipment out in the community to collect noise data. We'll hold a second series of meetings, probably in February, to share uh, the noise monitoring data that we've gathered. And most importantly, we will continue to work with the FAA representatives as they analyze potential mitigation measures, and we will invite the FAA to participate in our community meetings or help them organize their own public outreach meetings here in Phoenix. Mayor Stanton, members of the City Council, we're requesting your direction and approval to contract with Lanham and Brown to assist the Aviation Department in conducting the public outreach process. We, we are recommending the placement of temporary noise monitoring equipment in the community based on public feedback that we, we receive at the community meetings. And we request the FAA to uh, continue, we want to continue to collaborate that with them at the federal level to identify and analyze mitigation measures to address the community concerns and share the progress of their community outreach and analysis here in Phoenix um, at the federal level um, with the House and Senate Appropriations Committee. We would also utilize our Washington DC representation to facilitate additional congressional outreach. Mayor and Council, I wanted to point out that this presentation is now available at skyharbor.com in case there was anything there that was difficult to see. I right, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Fisher. Mr. City Manager, is there anything else additional from, uh, from your end? Okay, so um, I appreciate the presentation uh, according to the, to the setup that I said at the beginning. Now I'll turn to the members of the Council uh, for up to five minutes of uh, of questions, uh, then we're going to hear from the uh, community, provide their testimony and input uh, on what's going on in your neighborhood as well as the information that was provided here today. I did indicate I was going to hand it over to Councilman Pastor first and Councilman Nowakowski uh, second. Um, their districts are disproportionately impacted by the discussion here today. Councilman Pastor. Good afternoon and uh, thank you for participating in this uh, community and policy session. Um, in all of this is I believe that we can come to a collaboration and work very due diligence in looking at this for the future uh, and possible changes. I have many questions uh, for FAA um, and I'm just going to rattle them off. Uh, if you like a copy, you could have a copy of it, but I personally would like a copy of your presentation because there are certain uh, aspects of your presentation that I could not hear clearly and probably will have questions for. So, um, and thank you for responding back to me um, with the letter that I directed to uh, Mr. Huerta. Um, appreciate it. Uh, there are several of my colleagues that have many questions and so we kind of didn't want to repeat, so I'm gonna do the ones that I think are very important and then my other colleagues will have the follow-up of them. Uh, noise questions. Uh, how do airlines decide which departure routes to use for flights? Do the same flights always use the same routes? Do cargo planes use the same flight paths and what are their noise impacts and is it measured? How have the September uh, departure changes impacted flight patterns of the helicopters and the small planes? because I am seeing and hearing more helicopters and small planes in the flight path. Uh, some communities are noticing more traffic really over their neighborhoods. How is FAA directing planes that lack satellite technology? How are they, uh, of course, are moving? If planes ascend faster upon departure, how will this affect sound levels in neighborhoods? but how it also affect efficiency. Um, so, and 
some residents are questioning FAA's assumptions that a higher level of noise is acceptable in downtown urban areas and that overflights would not be disrupt disruptive to a normal conversation. This is inconsistent with the conditions residents are experiencing now. What remedies can FAA consider to address the situation? So what is happening, uh, we were used to sitting outside and having a conversation. And now as you sit outside or you have your windows open or your door open, all there is is noise going through our historic homes. In particular, also our windows, because uh, we have a historic windows and, and I don't mind, I haven't changed. And uh, I can hear everything coming in and out of, of the, through the window with it closed and the door. So we are having um, some noise issues. Uh, now that the State Historic Preservation Office rescinded its letter of support, what will FAA do next? What is the status of the FAA's review of the community's recommendation presented in October? In particular, a letter was sent uh, with one of our uh, constituents, and I don't see him, that gave some really good impact, Im input on the changing of the flight patterns and what airlines uh, or airplanes needed to do, and I really want to know if that was considered and looked at. Um, when will a response be ready? In the original letter, it said we will do these things that are following things, patterns, and, and there was never a timeline or set timeline as to when we will see it. Uh, just recently, things, uh, and I don't have the, the, the presentation in front of me, but I heard spring. When in spring? Spring is from, could start from February all the way to uh, May or June, really, and our spring starts very early here. Uh, I know that we go by uh, seasons, but our spring really starts in uh, February. And so uh, really want to know a timeline and be able to look at that. Um, and my last question is, who from the FAA notified the proposed flight path changes to the aviation department leadership? How and when did that happen? And who did the FAA contact? Because we're having some uh, dialogue back and forth internally as to when we were contacted, who got contacted, what happened, where. So we're trying to figure out where all the miscommunication is happening. I'm in great hope that uh, we collectively could come together and really collaborate and solve the issue uh, before any of us on our, any of my colleagues, because we all are talking amongst ourselves, if we have to go uh, fight it legally. And that's not really the way I would like to go. I want to look at it as I teach students in high school of seven habits of a highly effective teen, where we can work collaboratively and have a win-win for all of us and not go for a lose-lose or a lose-win. Um, so those are my questions. I'm sure I'll have more later, but I started it. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Councilman. There's a lot of questions there, so let's break them down into their uh, components parts. Uh, you know, what is the status of that, the community recommendations that are provided to aviation staff and the FAA? Um, we, it, there were some very, there were some experts in the neighborhood, thank goodness, who provided some ideas about uh, how we could resolve this issue and still meet the FAA's requirements for safety and efficiency. What's the status of that, as far as we know? Mr. I, Martin, I, I guess think I could answer. Please. I'm yeah. sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Um, I do believe that, uh, if I may say so, I believe it's Mr. Wheaton Smith, and he provided those at the listening session as well as I believe. I've received them from the Department of Aviation, and I believe, I, I think Congressman Pastor, okay. <laughs> I've had a lot of congressionals, but I'm pretty sure I remembered that one. So He's the uh, most important <laughs> one, just for the record. Yeah. Fair yeah. enough. So yes, I, I just wanted you to know we have received those. Uh, as far in, in response a little bit to your timeline, understand we continue to get input and we certainly want to give that an opportunity to happen as well as making certain that we understand what is happening today so that if we find a way to adjust this that it actually has a mitigating factor instead of you know an aggravating one and that's part of what takes time 
Uh, other factors, as I referenced, were, of course, this will have to go through a safety check as well as an environmental and a legal analysis before we could make the change. So those are the th steps that are taking time to get through. All right, th uh, thank you very much. I guess uh, the question is, are you proposing a different process for any mitigation actions the FMA take than were originally put into place uh, for the, uh, the changes that were, uh, that, that were made uh, in September? If there is a change, it took us several years to develop and implement the procedures September 18th. We're turning these changes around that we're looking at today in months, and that's the only change. The same steps still are apply. Uh, Councilwoman asked about the effect, the effect of the SHPO, our State Historic Preservation Officer, originally had sent a letter uh, indicating um, non-opposition, I don't know if support is the right word, but non-opposition to the changes. I think the new letter indicates that uh, maybe all the information hadn't been provided to our SHPO, and so the SHPO has provided a very different letter now indicating that there is not uh, non-opposition, certainly not support. Uh, what, it, what, is the, uh, what, what does the FAA do with this new important information from the State Historic Preservation Officer? I'm uh, sorry to say that I've not seen this letter, so it's difficult to comment on, but we'll certainly take a look and apply that most likely in the environmental assessment of where we're at and where we can, what we can do to make mitigations. Okay, that, uh, thank you very much. I think the, the information I got, I think all the council members got was that uh, the, that letter was a very important consideration in the, in the FAA's next gen uh, changes. And my impression now is that our, our state historic preservation officer feels uh, differently at this point in terms of the impact on, uh, on the historic neighborhood. So that, that is an important letter to, uh, uh, to get to you. Um, Councilman also asked you about um, n acceptable noise levels in more urban downtown neighborhoods than, than elsewhere. And, you know, I think she, there, there were some questions about whether or not essentially a conversation in downtown between neighbors uh, is done at a higher decibel than conversations uh, elsewhere. I mean, we can all agree that it's not. And so does the FAA have a different uh, noise threshold for urban neighborhoods than other neighborhoods uh, as, they, as they analyze next gen or any other uh, uh, changes to departures? With due respect, it, it would be time consuming and I probably am not expert enough to explain how the rules through the you know, National Environmental Protection Act follow and, and the standards and the trigger points at which uh, significant impact would have been determined. I think if that's something the council wanted, uh, I would certainly take that request and try and have someone here that can walk you through it. It's usually a seven day training course to get someone through NEPA, but I think I could probably have someone do that in you know possibly an hour, at least giving you the high level ways that NEPA is applied through the process. Okay, I, I think that would be essential that we'd want to know that because the impression is is that urbanized downtown neighborhoods are being treated differently than other uh, uh, neighborhoods. At least that's our layperson's understanding of how the FAA goes through its uh, uh, noise analysis as it relates to next gen and, uh, and the departure. Uh, another question by the councilman was uh, cargo planes and other um, other planes. How is that factored uh, factored in as those as those planes are also going over? Uh, these neighborhoods? I would not expect any difference in filing from cargo planes to uh, an airline, as you suggest. The predominant uh, factor, I believe, in their flight planning is around the weather, meaning the winds and the, and the weather that they're going to incur and what route they can, they uh, determine to be the most effective route to get from here to wherever they're going but there shouldn't be any difference between cargo and airline. And what about the, uh, the aircraft that doesn't have the specific technology, uh, the most modern technology? How is FAA directing them to utilize uh, the appropriate path and not the inappropriate one? Uh, it would be, as we would say, as we used to by vectors, giving issuing headings to the aircraft instead of the avionics flying the aircraft along the prescribed route, we would turn, you know, issue turns to them and give them specific headings to fly. Okay, and then the, the question was also one of ascension. If the ascension, uh, were, if we were to uh, have a mitigation plan that would involve ascension faster upon a departure, 
uh, how would this impact noise in the uh, affected neighborhoods? I think it's relatively safe to say higher is most likely to have less noise impact on the ground. However, the difficulty in that is you're at a critical stage of flight taking off and, you know, depending on the, uh, you know, how fast you're trying to climb, unfortunately you also have some rather dramatic weather here and during the hot, dry summers it's even harder to climb. So something like that isn't ruled out and we are taking a look at the possibility of something like that, but it's, uh, you know, safety is probably the biggest concern we have with uh, coming up with some way for them to ascend quicker. There were a lot of questions there, Council. I want to make sure I got all the questions that you needed um, asked. I think that we will leave it, see it, save it for later. I think it's going to come up later about the communication between the FAA and Sky Harbor and whether the, the communication was effective uh, such that the Sky Harbor officials could take uh, appropriate action. But I'm going to pass it on to other council members now for other questions they may have. But, but we're going to come back. That question is going to be answered to the best of our ability today about the communication between uh, these entities. Other council, Councilman Nowkowski, please. Five First, minutes. thank you, Mayor. And I want to thank you, Mr. Martin, for coming. I know that um, you met with us in the community back in October. I think it was October 16th. Um, saying that, I want you to help me understand why would you communicate or have conversations with our historic preservation, our state historic preservation office, and not communicate to our city historic preservation office? Can you kind of explain that to me? I, I don't really have an excuse for why we wouldn't didn't reach out to the city. I don't know uh, what process was expected to be followed, and uh, I can follow up and find an answer. But it was probably appropriate to say that in trying to be transparent about things that happened, we tried to show you that we did take certain steps. I think it's clear based on what I've heard from your communities it probably wasn't enough because we didn't anticipate this being the significant impact that it's been. So I'm certainly not here to tell you we did everything right and everything we should have done because we should not have ended up with this kind of a, a response from this. We're just trying to share with you what we did do so that everyone can understand the steps we did take. And saying understanding the process, I like to understand the process of when did our staff from the airport actually get any type of communication from the FAA on this process and on the change? Um, because we're hearing different dates and um, we are receiving letters from the FAA. I'm hearing reports from our staff. And I'm just wondering when was the first initial meeting and who was informed on, on these changes? I think the, you know, your airport staff is best suited to explain to you what they feel they knew when and from whom. The FAA is really not expending any resources to try and look back to figure out where we tried to communicate with them. We are trying to look forward. We are trying to analyze where we are at today and what possibility we have in making the adjustments to mitigate the, the issues that have been raised to us. We're not really looking at who told who what when. We are trying to be transparent to show you what we have in our records. I believe we're getting ready to release several hundred pages of documents that uh, various people have requested. So we're trying to be transparent, but it's not our intent to try and go through, sorry, and, and answer your right. question specifically. Well, Mr. Martin, I, I just want some clarification because what we're getting notified by our upper management at the airport is that they got notified on September 17th and then you implemented this process on September 18th. I, I mean, I don't think a day before <coughs> implementing a major change to our air flight um, is appropriate. So I'm just figuring out, was there a lack of communication or is it on our end, on your end? And I just want some clarification. Is that norm that you would give an airport a day's notice before making these major changes? As you stated, a day before the implementation mm -hmm. is inappropriate. And I would agree with you on that. 
uh, I think it's fair to say that um, the Aviation Department and I are having some very difficult conversations about where we feel it broke down and what we need to do to make sure that it doesn't happen again. Mayor, Councilman Nowakowski, I do want to make one clarification. Um, we did have about two weeks notice prior to the implementation of this date. The information that we received the day before the procedures were implemented was this environmental uh, review information, the noise analysis. So what we had not seen prior up, up until that point was the FAA's analysis about expected noise impacts. But we did uh, learn of the expected implementation date uh, from our staff. We did not receive any official notification um, from the FAA directly at the leadership level, but it was prior to the day before the implementation. So if I may, I, I would want to make that clear. Mr. Martin, just some just to help me understand all this too, is that it's my understanding, I'm not sure if it's true or not, maybe you can clarify this, but um, North Texas had a, a stakeholders meeting that you all put on the FAA um, prior to any changes on October 22nd of this year, and that you have planned in the future stakeholder meetings and outreach meetings to the community um, for DC on 6-10-2015, and also for Southern California in September of 2016. Um, and then you have other ones that are still pending uh, for Florida, Cleveland, and Detroit. So if this is true, why didn't Phoenix get treated the same way? And that's my concern. Because one of the things that we're really, we take a lot of pride here in the city of Phoenix is our whole budget process is transparent. We bring it out to the community. We have about 22, 16 to 22 community hearings on our budget. Before we make any cuts of any departments, we get input from the community. And we take pride in that. And we call it the, um, the Phoenix way. Um, t and I call it the Team Phoenix way of uh, approaching issues. So I was just wondering, is this true? And why was Phoenix treated differently? The the difference was, unfortunately, in how we ran the project. The Phoenix project was essentially driven and uh, led from the local facilities uh, with assistance from the support organizations uh, within the region and, and so forth. And as I said, most of this design work and so forth had been done years earlier. And it was unfortunate that the implementation rolled forward without the outreach that you know was obviously expected here, and I think would have went a long way in uh, at least trying to address some of the concerns and possibly getting the input we needed prior to implementation. The re outreach that you discuss is actually a nationwide uh, project management that we're doing uh, from a headquarters level. Uh, and in fact, we have begun one here. We call it a Metroplex project. And it, it began November 4th. And we're looking to doing design work over the next nine months here under that auspice. So Mr. Martin, that was after it was actually implemented. I'm talking about these other cities that it hasn't been implemented yet. And you're asking for community input. Now you're coming to us after it's implemented, after these, these neighborhoods are being affected. We have historic um, neighborhoods that were once quiet neighborhoods where people were wanting to move in and to live in these historic neighborhoods. Now you have residents that want to move out of these neighborhoods. One, it was a point of pride for the city of Phoenix. Now they're becoming areas that nobody wants to live in because of the air path. So my, my concern is that you had these stakeholder meetings prior to implementing it now we're talking about an after fact that happened here in the city of Phoenix and that it's affecting the home values of our historic neighborhoods. And that's one of the biggest concerns I have. And just to follow up, I know that you have in the FAA letter response to us is that you're gonna be having community outreach meetings. So when, where, and what type, when, when do you plan to have these outreach meetings? Uh, we're talking with the Department of Aviation now. We believe we certainly will be back in January and then again in February is what the plan is. I don't have specific dates for you today. 
Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Uh, I'll pass it over to Council Member Gallego. E ask each of the speakers the best of your ability. Uh, speaking to the microphone, there's a large crowd here, and they, they are hanging on your every word, literally, and they want to hear it. So make sure uh, to best uh, move the microphone closer to the mouth. Councilwoman. Thanks, Mayor. At our October meeting and in the audience today, we had many individuals who do not live along Grand Avenue but who were uh, impacted by this particular change. So I, I was disappointed in your letter that it really focused on just one one neighborhood when it is much broader and it includes the new depart departure changes to the south and some over downtown. So I just would love to have your commitment that the solution will not just focus on one neighborhood but all of the changes. Please. All right, thank, you. thank you very much. I appreciate the reaction except that we have to keep the quorum in this meeting for a variety of reasons. Not like we have got to keep the meeting moving uh, going. Uh, so please. I, we're certainly interested in taking that input. So if there's input along those lines, I, I think it's important for people to give us their input. Right now it is holiday season and uh, Councilwoman Pastor alluded to the cargo traffic, but we are hearing a lot of complaints that I believe are related to higher cargo traffic. So I would also ask that your mitigation plan look at cargo traffic. It certainly will. Okay, and, and look at it separately because we do have seen already a seasonal change in those complaints and people are saying most of that traffic is at night and it's impacting their ability to sleep. Um, you spoke earlier, uh, we talked about that some of the Grand Avenue, there was the mistaken impression that it was going over industrial areas and that was why we chose that departure. Could you explain on the southern departure, we moved away from river and on to residential neighborhoods and could you speak to why that decision was made? I'm afraid I don't have an answer for you tonight. I would uh, have to get back to you on that. Okay, but you would be willing to get back to us? Certainly. On that. Um, some of the neighborhoods in, in uh, surrounding downtown and south of downtown have very heavy Spanish language population and they're probably not as comfortable s participating in this type of hearing, so will our outreach plan take into account that some of the impacted neighborhoods are not as well organized and will need Spanish language Hearings, and perhaps our staff might be better to be more familiar with the. Mayor, Councilwoman Gallego, we do have translation services available and we'll be sure to have those at all of our community outreach meetings. And I know that we can make those available for the FAA while they're uh, conducting their outreach here in Phoenix. Wonderful, and I think we need to, when we look at the locations for the community hearings, take public transit locations very seriously and look for locations that are in the communities where the, we have the highest percentage of individuals without cars. It's, it's not easy to get to downtown, but it's much more difficult if you are facing transit. And we did have individuals who work hourly who we, our office spoke to and we said, you know, if there's a hearing today, please come and express the concerns. I think that perhaps the issue has been more simplified and we wanna make sure the full breadth of the community is represented. But they said, look, if I take off now, I work hourly and this is my kid's Christmas present, so they ask that we s speak on their behalf, but this does not represent the full diversity of the community, and so I hope the, the solution will, will represent them. And I wanted to speak on behalf of our Levine area in Southwest Phoenix, so the departures are now turning uh, more, more earlier, so uh, further to the east than they used to, and we've gotten a lot of um, complaints in that area. Could you address that? And you wanna put the microphone? in South Phoenix as well, and, and lower to the ground. You're stating that you're getting noise concerns from the Levine area, is that, I'm, I'm right. trying to understand. Right, and if you wanna go to the map, we can, so the plane, the, the turn is moving closer to the airport. I guess you could call it turning earlier, would that be an accurate way to describe that change? Southbound. Yeah. Mayor Stanton, Councilwoman Gallego. Uh, the majority of the focus has been on the Grand Avenue corridor to this point, although we have uh, received and transmitted to the FAA concerns that have come in from the Levine area. 
I might suggest that perhaps the focus has been on the Grand Avenue corridor because specific mitigation measures were requested and the FAA has been reviewing them. But we will make sure that our outreach meetings are made available to that community mm -hmm. and that we will take a closer look at the noise complaints that are coming from the Levine area and we'll collaborate with the FAA to um, do our best to develop ideas on how those, those noise concerns can be mitigated moving forward. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you very much, Council Members, well, your Chair of uh, Aviation. Do you wanna go next and I think the Vice Chair wanted to go afterwards, thanks. No, Mayor, actually, you know what? I, I wanna thank city staff for uh, doing their diligence and I wanna thank everyone who's taking their time out. I know this is not the easiest time to have a public uh, meeting, especially well, any public meeting that we have in this building is, is pretty important, and uh, this is definitely no exception. So um, I see some familiar faces. We were able to meet with several neighborhood leaders. Uh, my office and I have had a chance to do that, um, I wanna say a couple of months ago now. Uh, it's something that we have, with the neighborhood leaders, uh, submitted a, uh, a letter like I probably every member of this council has the federal delegation and to the FAA. Uh, in fact, I wanna go back to that community meeting. Uh, we had city staff there, it's something that we've all done together. And uh, this is, it, it's, a, it's a good meeting to have and right now I have no, no questions. Well, and, and others may go uh, I do wanna also Please. mention uh, also, I do wanna mention that this is an item, obviously this is not gonna go away tomorrow, unfortunately, but this is an item that we will be seeing on a regular basis as a standing item uh, in the Downtown Aviation Redevelopment Subcommittee as, as chair of that subcommittee. Thank you very much. Vice Mayor? Uh, I'm Brad, actually, I'd like to use the rest of this time if you, if you allow me to use it. <laughs> I'm, I'm willing to give my time to one of my colleagues if, uh, if that's okay. All right, let's let the Vice Mayor go. Okay. I'm actually furious to be here at this meeting. Uh, th this shouldn't happen. We spend hundreds of thousands of dollars, uh, for those of you who don't come to most of our council meetings. We spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on lobbyists related to the airport and organizations, national organizations of airport executives and so forth. So I guess I don't understand how, uh, whether it's one day or two weeks, how this could sneak up on us when it sounds like what the FAA is telling us is this has wor been worked on for years. So the fact that it sounds like nobody on the council know, particularly the affected areas. I've had three complaints from my area I don't think any of those people are here today, so, so this is more um, me just speaking, I guess, as vice mayor. Uh, very frustrated that this is, this is necessary, given that it seems like there's a complete breakdown in communication between the FAA and our airport, and, and the citizens who are here are actually bearing the brunt of it, property values and so forth. So it's not an acceptable situation by any stretch of the imagination. Um, I understand you don't wanna go back and do a lot of who shot John, that old phrase, but, but realistically that might be productive because it seems like somebody forgot to email somebody and certainly didn't let any of us know, it sounds like, and it left all these guys up here hanging. Again, I have three people complaining and I take those complaints very seriously, but they got hundreds. And that's, that's really not an acceptable outcome given how much money is spent by taxpayers to avoid this exact scenario to the FAA. Whenever these, these routes get changed, you know there's gonna be people complaining, and I'm not saying it's not, to some extent, it's just not avoidable because you got planes, they're gonna make noise, they gotta go over somebody's house somewhere, but a change of what looks like to be this magnitude, I don't understand how that's not a bigger production. The, uh, I guess, timeline or whatever that we're gonna do now after the fact to change the problem that's been created, I mean, that might sound fine, and I'll get to that in a second, but some of that stuff, it just seems like should have been done before now. Um, as far as what I'd be thinking if I was a citizen sitting out there and listening to this, I don't know, I gotta tell you, I think it was gobbledygook. And so I would probably not walk out of here tonight if I lived in one of these neighborhoods, feeling great about the chances that this is gonna get changed. And I guess I'll just ask a direct question. Why sitting up here as a councilman representing, or at least as vice mayor representing uh, this group of people, why wouldn't, my first recourse, rather than wait and see how it plays out, be to, as Councilman Pastor mentioned, I don't wanna do it, but authorize our lawyers to sue. 
it's about the only recourse I can think of that we got. So I just, All right, thank you. I, I, guess I, I guess I don't understand what we get by waiting, hoping that maybe the process that was so flawed that we wound up here in the first place is gonna somehow produce a better result the second time around. I just, I wouldn't feel comfortable pitching that to anybody who's in the audience who's affected. So what, what makes me think this is gonna be better the second time around? All right, so I guess uh, maybe I'll politely request Mr. Martin to answer that question. I'm not on the litigation side of it, but uh, I guess uh, the vice mayor is asking for hope. Uh, can you give him any hope? <laughs> and I rarely, if ever, do that for those of you. <laughs> well, I believe that uh, you have had a number of community folks step up to communicate not only their concerns, but their ideas and, and their uh, knowledge of the local area as well as their knowledge of aviation as well. I think that they have heard me come out here and tell them that we've heard them, that we are taking the, into consideration their recommendations as well as working with the Department of Aviation and the, avi and the airline industry, er airline partners to look at this and find what solutions are possible. I think the frustration, as you mentioned, is there is around how long this type of process takes. It's not going to be the FAA's intent to move from this problem to the next problem to the next problem. So we're, you know, we're not only looking at the solutions, we're making sure that we're not just moving the problem somewhere else. And that's the difficult balance that takes some time and it takes some process to work its way through. Is it possible to, sorry, Mayor. No, go ahead. Um, is it possible to go back to the original flight pan, plans, <laughs> pathways, <laughs> since they've been already approved and everything else, go back to the original flight paths and start, go back to the drawing board, and then we evaluate and look at, do the process correctly. With the, with the city aviation and FAA collaborating and communicating and doing it, going back and doing it right. So I guess the question is, is that on the table as, as you are taking all this information in or gonna obviously come back with your mitigation efforts as required by Congress in this uh, recent appropriations bill, is that one of the options that FAA is looking at? The FAA has not ruled out any options, so that is certainly still an option. However, to go back is going to take us as long as fixing it today. So it, it is the same, it, it's because we still have to go through the same processes. We can't just move the noise and, and it just be that simple. It's not easy for us to go through this without going through the same steps. So rather than go back and then try and do this later, we're just trying to get it fixed as quickly as we possibly can. So would that be 90 days? Are we going to have this fixed in 90 days? I do not think so. Okay, so I guess um, I'm going, <laughs> you got me going now, so. Uh, and Mayor, just to interject, since we're still on my time, I am retroactively giving my time that was left <laughs> to Councilwoman Pastor. I'm done. So she, she had let me one more question. We'll have an opportunity to come back, but Councilman, please go ahead. And then there are other council members that uh, want to have questions as well. Go ahead. So what would it take for it to uh, happen in 90 days? And who, what directive needs to be given? By whom? Congress? Well, Congress certainly can make decisions and, and give us direction, that's certainly, uh, Vice Mayor mentioned legally, I mean, those types of things certainly would have the effect that you would expect them to have. As far as the FAA is concerned, you have our attention, you have our devotion. Uh, part of the problem that is a concern is you have the Super Bowl, and that is actually terribly affecting air traffic for the next six to eight weeks or whatever it is, six, seven weeks until that occurs. We have many procedures that we put in specifically to ensure that you have a good Super Bowl here and we'll be training controllers and getting ready for that and running through that process and that is actually affecting some of the timeline. Thank you. All right, Councilman Cecil. Well, thank you, Mr. Martin, for coming out today. Uh, like Councilman Waring, both of us are known for being pretty direct. Um, 
what I've heard here today just tells me that this is nothing more than a delay tactic. I mean, I hear this constantly when I'm over here. And, and I've got to tell you, it's, it's bothersome. And I appreciate the frankness and your responses to this, but I've got to tell you, it's very troublesome when you really aren't going to planning to do anything. And I hope you are, but when you're at the end of the day, you're not going to do anything. Why not just tell us? I, I plan on keeping it in this direction. It'd just be a lot easier than we would know how to move forward. Uh, like Councilman Waring, um, I'm going to follow Councilman Nowakowski and Pastor's um, lead on this thing, but quite frankly, you haven't given me personally any confidence that anything's going to change. And why should these people be subject to another 90 days of this when you've admitted right off the bat that there were errors? Well, if there are errors, then you've got to go back and fix it. And going back to the original plan or the flight plan would seem like it would be a natural thing to do. And I get the fact that you may have to study it again, but you just did it and you just, con and you just changed it. Um, I do want to ask you a couple questions on that. That's a statement I've got on that. And I've got to tell you, it's, if I were on that side of it, I would be an, and in the public side of it. I've seen this on a daily basis where you hear government speak. It's we're going on a listening tour. <laughs> we're going on a tour of listening with the public asset. That usually occurs at the beginning, not at the end. Now you said you're going to be releasing hundreds of documents to the public. Is that every single document you have on this issue? I didn't say to the public. I said there are people who have requested it from the public and that I knew we were releasing those documents. I don't know specifically who those individuals are. I know there's at least a few law firms and so forth. So I'm aware that they're being released. My point to you is to be continuing to show you that we are trying to be transparent in what we have and release it. And is it is it every single document? Everything. To my knowledge, it is all of the documentation surrounding the environmental assessment. Well, could you, beyond the environmental assessment, could you release all the documents you relate to this, even to the point of communications you've had with the City of Phoenix, everything? I don't see any reason why we wouldn't go through that process if requested, yes. I'm requesting. Um, and if you could please send that to the city staff that we could have those documents. It'd be good for the public to know what really occurred and let them wade through it as well. Now, since the, in, do I have your commitment to do that? No, you don't. No, I don't. I don't have the commitment to get I'll, those I'll documents. I'll take your request, but you don't why have Why would you commitment. give it to me? Or that there, there is the Freedom of Information Act, and I'm not telling you to go through it. Yeah. I'm taking your request. Mm -hmm. I will certainly do what we can. I don't know what we have that isn't released, but if uh, the Department of Aviation is interested in documents, I'll work to get whatever documents you request for And them. you understand when you say you're being transparent and you're telling me, no, I cannot commit to you, I will give you everything I've got. Why wouldn't you do that? You're the government. You're supposed to. We own the information. No, so what's I, it gonna take I said that to I couldn't it? take the commitment from you tonight. In order to do that, I need to process it through federal laws on what I can release and when and to who. I'm assuming you're making a request. I'll take that request and I'll release what the law allows me to release. And then let me ask Tammy Fisher. Tammy, would you be willing to write a letter to the federal government requesting all documentation that they can provide? Is that a yes or no? Uh, Mayor Stanton, Councilman DeCicio, we can do that. Okay, thank you. Councilman, maybe uh, at the end, uh, that could be part of the motion as well if the direct city sure. staff could do that. Thank you, Mayor. That's a good point. I won't make the motion, but you know, something we could add Whoever in later. Does, yeah. And then secondly, since they're going to give us all the information, our airport, are you willing to release all the information related to this as well? Every document that you have, every meeting that was conducted with the FAA, everything so we can see that. Uh, Mayor and Councilman DeCicio, we, c we will make available everything that we have uh, related to this topic. Okay, thank you. And that makes it a lot easier for the public to be able to get their hands on it. They'll be able to see it, and, we'll, and so will members of the media and members of this council. Uh, and finally, and just in this part here, because I think when it comes down to information, once you have the, all the information in your hands, then the public can make a right determination. Uh, that's one. Number two, again, all I've heard is nothing but a delay tactic here. I think that's unacceptable. I think it's wrong, especially when there's an admittance right off the bat that this was not handled correctly. 
literally you, in your presentation, you said this was not handled correctly. Well, then fix it. And it needs to be fixed in a time where people don't have to be subjected to this kind of, uh, this kind of pain. The third thing, the city of Phoenix has invested millions of dollars in this community, in this area for revitalization. The public has invested, the citizens have invested hundreds of millions of dollars with some level of expectation that they were gonna be treated fairly from everybody and that just has not happened here. So like Councilman Waring has said, and I believe Councilman Nowakowski and others up here, I don't see any benefit for us to sit back and wait at all, zero. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Thank you very much, Councilman, uh, Councilman Gates. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Martin. I appreciate you being here um, today to answer these questions and our, and our airport staff as well. As I've listened uh, to everything, um, you know, I I'm confused. I, 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 don't, I don't really know what happened. There's dates being thrown around, and uh, I'm guessing I'm not the only person here that's confused by this. And so, you know, what I, I think it's important um, that we uh, look internally and we investigate exactly what happened and I know some people may not want to talk about who know who knew what when but it's important one for the people who are here the people whose lives are being impacted and then also for the next situation that occurs and you know up in our area Vice Mayor Waring and I we've had issues with the Scottsdale uh, airport uh, with noise complaints and other things and you know frankly we were just sort of told deal with it um, and so I'm happy that you're here, that we're having this discussion, but it's unfortunate that it took this terrible of a situation that's negatively Im impacting people to this extent. So, you know, I, I'd, I'd like, and again, maybe that's something that needs to be a, as part of a motion uh, as well as we can have a real investigation to, to, to get to the bottom of these details because right now I don't, I don't have a clear picture of what happened when, who knew what, what discussions, that, that took place and I think it would be helpful uh, to, to all of us as, as we move forward. And I will uh, take you, Mr. Martin, at your word that everything is on the table. Um, you know, I mean, we have for those of you who've flown out of John Wayne Airport in, you know, Southern California, there are certain things that are done, I'm not an expert in the area, to address uh, noise concerns over there. Um, we, need to, we need to believe that everything is on the table uh, and that moving forward, there will be a better um, interaction with the community and the opportunity for all of these people here and the next group of individuals in the city of Phoenix who are impacted to really have their voices heard. That's our job, uh, to represent those folks and to make sure that, uh, that their concerns are addressed. Thank you. All right, thank, uh, thank you very much. Um, I, I just, in addition to the question, but now just one more additional question before we take public comments. I know a lot of people here uh, have been waiting a long time and they want to provide their input, thoughts, uh, and passionate feelings on this issue. The imp so in the recent uh, federal pro uh, appropriations bill, Cromnibus, as, they, uh, as we're calling it, I guess, around the country, uh, led by Congressman Pastor, there was specific language in there requiring FAA to identify appropriate mitigation measures for this exact situation to enforce adherence to flight procedures and the report to uh, Congress. I'm gonna hear from uh, Mr. Martin from you. Uh, what, 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 what is the legal impact of that from the FAA's perspective? Well, I think, I guess my response would be just as I believe Congress has delivered a vision for the air transportation system that they've asked us to come out and modernize it, that direction would be respected and followed as clearly as any legislation that was passed. So. I think, you know, if I can fondly say, I think it's a kick in the butt to the FAA to get on this and mitigate this for the community, and, and that's how I believe we take that. Okay, uh, I'm gonna, now, I know there's gonna be a lot of other uh, questions as they come up. I'm looking at other council members, if a chance. Cal council Williams, please. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I just want to make a couple comments on, I, I really abhor the way this whole process has gone and what has occurred. Uh, I have to leave pretty quick. I have a prior uh, appointment before this meeting was scheduled. But I know the recommendations that have been made, I don't think that they go far enough. I think it needs to have some time steps on it, some caps. Uh, this looks like unlimited time to proceed and to have 
hearings and et cetera and drag this on forever. And I have real concerns about this because I think this is something that really needs to be addressed. If the statement you made, the fact that a lot of this hinges on you can't make changes before the Super Bowl. In that case, if I know we're on the countdown to the Super Bowl, we have the holidays, then the Super Bowl, but in a, a consideration you've made the day after the Super Bowl, could you revert the pattern and start over? Mr. Martin? We would not be prepared to do that, no. Okay. So I, I think that we need to pursue uh, this in whatever, whatever legal way we need to do as soon as possible to help these people. All right, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Williams. Okay, uh, and I know more comments are gonna come from the, uh, 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 the council uh, as issues come up by, raised by members of the community, but I do wanna go to the cards next. I think Vice Mayor has a time uh, limitation. He may have to sneak uh, out of here. Um, and other council members are going to do the same thing, but we will keep a quorum, so even if they're not physically here, they will be uh, listening telephonically throughout the meeting. I have actually have a, a time limitation, but hopefully we'll get through the cards before then. Uh, David Saridge, representing American Airlines, you have up, uh, have up to two minutes to provide testimony. Please come to the mic to, uh, to my right, your left. Thank you, Mayor Stanton and uh, City Council. Uh, we just want to make sure that you all understand that we are uh, at American Airlines and, and all the industry are, are willing to work with um, the FAA and the city of Phoenix to help with the mitigation strategies and um, you know, make this a, a better solution for all of us. Thank you very much uh, for, for attending today's meeting. We appreciate your willingness to partner uh, and be part of the solution to this uh, dilemma. Thank you very much. Next will be Bill Scheel followed by uh, Monica Sanchefer, uh, representing uh, Congressman-elect Ruben Gallego. Mr. Scheel. Followed by Gigi George. So we're gonna try to line people up so we can go through as quickly as, uh, as possible so everyone has a chance to, to testify. Thank you, uh, Mayor and Council Bill Scheel. I'm Vice Chair of the City's Historic Preservation Commission here representing the Commission. Uh, as uh, Councilman DeCicio pointed out, the city uh, and the private sector homeowners have invested millions and millions of dollars in our historic neighborhoods. Uh, I thank, uh, and the commission thanks Councilman Nowakowski and Councilwoman Pastor for their leadership on this issue. Uh, we thank the aviation department for their hard work. Um, and we feel like the city is headed in the right direction we have a unified front here. We need to protect these neighborhoods. We hope that there can be a collaborative uh, solution worked out with uh, the FAA, and uh, we urge uh, the city to do all it can uh, to make sure our valuable historic resources in Central Phoenix are protected. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Bill Scheel. Monica Sanchefer, representing Congressman-elect Ruben Gallego, followed by Gigi Ord, followed by Ginger Maddox. Good thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Stanton and Council, for this opportunity to speak. Although Mr. Gallego isn't able to be here today, I just wanted to let you all know that the Congressman elect is very aware of this issue and the community and council concerns that have arisen. Once the Congressman takes office in early January, we will assign a staff person to act as a point person on this issue. <laughs> thank you to everyone who is here today, and we are committed to continuing community engagement efforts and we look forward to collaborating with all of you to resolve this in a timely uh, and productive fashion. Thank you. Thanks so very much. Gigi Jord, followed by Ginger Maddox, Ed Ballard afterwards. Gigi, good to see you. Thank you, Mayor. As you know, Gigi George, 1102 West Palm Lane. Uh, Councilman Nowakowski has touched on this, as Councilwoman Pastor has. The Encanto Citizens Association has worked diligently over the past four decades to improve the central city neighborhoods. But like Councilman Valenzuela, I'm a big believer in process, and I believe that we cannot change this immediately. We really have to go through the process that it takes. Uh, I also believe that a reasonable compromise will create a return to the harmonious existence the historic neighborhoods enjoyed prior to September 18th. Once all the facts have been researched, we believe a compromise can be reached and I know that Mr. Martin has not had opportunity 
I know the Council and Historic Preservation Commission has had the opportunity to see this from uh, the SHPO's office, but I would like to just read one paragraph. I think that if we can back up, we'll then be able to go forward in a more congenial manner. This is from the SHPO's office, Bill Collins, who signed concurrence on the first inquiry from the FAA. Given the concerns raised by the public, the Arizona SHPO requests that the FAA reopen for consideration the question of the new flight path effect on historic properties. Re we request that the FAA study the effects of the new noise pattern in cooperation with the City of Phoenix, representatives of the affected areas, and any other interested parties appropriate for consultation after under the Federal Historic Preservation Regulations, and this is the important part, 36 CFR Part 800. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Ms. George. Obviously, the, uh, uh, you know, I believe, I think most of the council believes, probably all the council believes, that the legal impact of um, our state historic preservation officer changing uh, is very, very important because uh, it, that approval was very important in order to move forward with the, uh, with the proposed changes. So I, I believe it's a very, very powerful impact, legal impact on this matter. Ms. Maddox, followed by Mr. Ballard, followed by Mr. Morris, John Morris, please. Good to see you. Mayor and council people, I am here today to speak for Simon Wheaton Smith, but I also have a couple comments to make uh, on my own after listening to the uh, conversation. First of all, I have applied through the Freedom of Information Act for the NEPA report. I was given an email just a couple days ago saying that the packet has been prepared, it will be sent to me via certified mail and it will be in CD form. It does take several weeks to get this document, so uh, I'm just now receiving it after a couple months. Secondly, I'd like to say that I am surprised that Mr. Martin was not aware of why SHPO had to be notified. Uh, I have done extensive research into the NEPA report and there are seven categories of requirement and st um, historic preservation happens to be one of those that needs to get a sign off on a no effect. Now I would like to, uh, Simon Wheaton is not here today and he asked me to read some prepared remarks. I, this is an abbreviated version. I do have the full version that I've made copies for that can be passed around to all of the members in the council and those representing the, um, the airport. He writes after reviewing the FAA letter sent to SHPO in August of 2013. My first reading of the document sent to SHPO went well. I myself probably would have concurred. However, that packet deserved a bit more scrutiny. For example, current SID and star waypoints would not change where airport currently flies. That suggests that not much is going to change. What if it had read that these two heavily used procedures receiving the entire West Coast will now fly along Grand Avenue and be in close proximity to many historic districts and other downtown neighborhoods? Formerly, the westbound departure point was nine nautical miles out. Under the new procedure, all traffic departing west will make their turn at three nautical miles. This suggests that three miles is a long way out. What would the response have been had the same sentence read? While the present turn north happens to be nine miles away, now we will turn three miles from the center of the airport or only two miles from the end of the runway. And to add to that, jet aircraft produce about 33,000 pounds of thrust per engine. They will be traveling over routes once used by quieter piston aircraft, which produced 1,000 pounds of horsepower per engine or less, and that the smaller craft fly much less frequently. The point is, when three miles is stated, it seems reasonable. Only one asks, where is three miles? And using the existing piston engine route sounds okay too, unless you realize that it is very little piston and prop usage for, of those routes and that they generate much less noise. Ms. Maddox, if you can wrap up uh, when you get a moment. We have a lot of other speakers. The clear failure of the FAA 
Well, you know, I would like to just read to, to the recommendations, which is what we provided before. There's just an, another couple of paragraphs here. But the proposal is, is to suspend the new routes while they are being fixed and revert to the old but still valid ones. Amend the new northwest departure routes to turn later somewhere between the old route and the new ones. Relocate the twin waypoints to achieve the previous option. To achieve the previous option. Evaluate and consider requiring steeper climbs at the expense of speed if that will mitigate noise. Encourage or require deeper power cutbacks when the aircraft level off to clear up and accelerate after takeoff. The, the second and third options will still offer fuel savings from the baseline for departures prior to the new routes being implemented. A win-win for everyone. Thank you for listening. Simon Wheaton Smith. And I do have the unabridged uh, version. If yeah, you make sure we submit it for the record as well. Thank you, Ms. Uh, Maddox. No one has gotten up to speed on the Byzantine rules of the FAA more than you in the last few months. And we really appreciate your, uh, your leadership on it. <laughs> Edward Ballard is next, followed by John Morris, followed by um, Ms. Carraway. Mayor, thank you. When I stand up here, I represent my entire neighborhood of 150 homes. When this all first took place, I thought it was kind of strange that the hours that these meetings would be held and a little bit of publicity was put out so that everybody could be here. So when I'm standing here and I'm telling you that I don't really appreciate having an aircraft fly over my house all night long, I'm speaking for everyone in the neighborhood. I hear the FAA talk that they can't change the flight path almost as if these aircraft are on steel rails. And yet I know the approach plates are updated every 30 days. We are what, the fifth or sixth largest city in the US? We had less than 300 complaints annually on our aircraft noise. They make one small change and now the entire city's up in arms. And I don't live in the historic district, I live in the south part, which we haven't even gotten there yet. It's not working. It wasn't working when you implemented it. You didn't actually do your studies, you just changed. You've made a big mistake. When I look at the map up there, what I see is a neighborhood street that worked very well and I have one angry child who is now cutting through the yards going, I can't change it and I'm not going to. It's not working, it's not gonna work and it will never work. You've shortened the flight time by what, three minutes? When I first started calling and complaining, it was about we're changing the carbon imprint on the environment. Nothing was ever suggested about the noise. You're talking about the Super Bowl now like it's a big deal. The airport's now handling less flights than it was in 2000, by almost 200,000 flights. The airplanes are now fuller than they were before. They're almost running all at max capacity, where before they would run at 25 and 50%. So all of the answers that I'm getting from the FAA make no sense. It can be changed, and it can be changed very quickly. Print some new plates, follow the new procedures. It happens and has happened for years. The old antiquated air system that we used to use, which was VOR, yeah, it needed to go away, absolutely. But you can draw points on a map anywhere you want to, anytime you want to, and fly that route. Thank you. Could you repeat your cross streets? 27th Avenue and Southern. Thank you. Mr. Uh, Morris is next, uh, followed by Mr. Carraway, followed by uh, Jerry McHugh. And up to two minutes, and obviously if the point's already been made, I know people are passionate about this issue, but uh, you can just indicate the point of, the point of your, uh, that has, has already been made, so we don't repeat ourselves, but I appreciate your testimony. Mr. Carraway, Mr. Uh, I just Morris. wanted to, uh, oh, I didn't want to interrupt you, Mayor. It's okay. Oh, I'm John Morris, I live in the Willow neighborhood. Um, this is old news to me. Uh, at all the meetings, I, I'm tired of coming to these meetings. We've all got better things to do. <clears throat> I think in all the meetings, the airport has said that they are uh, diligent about being good neighbors and the impact that they have on adjoining neighborhoods. I want to rewind the clock to 1992 and the federal lawsuit and the agreements that the City of Phoenix signed and the FAA signed for the noise mitigation and the flight departures that everybody now is calling the old flight departures. There's a signature for Thelda Williams on these documents. 
These are public documents. They're, rec they're recorded at the, at the county recorder's office. And I want to know why we threw these in the trash can and changed these departures. That's all I, that's the only question I have. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Morris. Mr. Carraway, followed by Jerry McHugh, followed by uh, Russ Cousins, I believe. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Up to My name is Lane Carraway, and I'm actually from Tempe. I have been advocating for several years, well, actually about 16 years. What I am here for is I used to hear all this from the mayor and council in Tempe that we cannot work with Phoenix. Phoenix doesn't want to work with us about airplane noise. We have lived through this for 40 plus years from Phoenix Airport. When I bought my home, I didn't have a noise issue. I have allegedly $65,000 worth of noise mitigation done to my home. Doesn't do anything. With your new flight plan, you basically have put the planes over all the residential neighborhoods of North Tempe and you spread them out to South Tempe. The reason you don't have people complaining from Tempe is they either have died, they're in a nursing home, or they have just are burnt out because they are tired of fighting Phoenix Airport. Also, I will not ask, I am demanding that you as a mayor and council approach my mayor and council, and I believe one of you have spoken to one of my council people, but work with them. Tempe, there are hundreds of Tempians that would jump down here if they knew they could get something done and approved because it, we have lived with it for so long, we are tired of it. I also would like to say, I would like to be included, and Tempe should be included on your outreach program. What happened to Phoenix happens to Tempe. If you change this, you had to change it on the other side. You have never included us. I was in, I also should announce that I am part of TABCO, which is the Tempe Aviation Commission. I am not speaking for TABCO today. Yeah. I'm speaking as the president of my neighborhood association and NTNA as North Tempe residents. You approached us with this program on August the 6th. So when you say you didn't know anything about it at the airport, that is misleading. The airport approached us on August the 6th and told us about it. So I would like to know, how can I trust people when in 40 years we haven't been able to trust anybody because you keep moving the goalposts, so Pardon. to speak, is a nice word. Thank I would like to see better away. dialogue with, the, with everybody. Please. Thank you so much. We're, we're just out of time. We have a tremendous number of speakers as well. Thank you for your testimony. It does uh, Okay. Thank you. Mr. McHugh is next, followed by Russ Cousins, followed by Don Conrad. Uh, Mayor Stanton, council member. My name is Jerry McHugh. I live in Fairview Place, which is a neighborhood immediately adjacent to the fairground. Uh, I'm sure I had opportunity to express my complaints elsewhere on other occasions, so I'm going to cut this short, but I'd like to offer a perspective to the council and to Mr. Martin. Um, I hate to use the age card, but I'm, I'm 85 and uh, I'm beating the actuarials. I've lived in our neighborhood for over 50 years and during that time have invested a considerable amount of money to make my property help me through my later days. Uh, my death isn't imminent. No. But I am expecting to get equity out of my property. And uh, I am told now that I've lost a good percentage of that equity after my long-term investment. So that's the one issue. As to the matter of noise, uh, I'm not a sound engineer. Uh, the simplest way I think you could determine what is good and what is bad is come to my house. I thought the city was being evacuated when the plane started coming by one every 60 or 80 seconds. And I didn't get the memo. And uh, what I want to do is have you come to my house on one of those busy moments and you won't need any sound equipment to determine whether it's bothering people or not. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. McHugh, for your longstanding leadership on behalf of historic neighborhoods. Russ Cousins is next, followed by Don Conrad, followed by Tim Moser. 
I, I live in Fairview Estates, and uh, I've talked to quite a few people here, actually. And I've come to this, actually to the mayor's office, and I waited an hour and a half to talk to somebody about this issue. And when he did show up, I knew bar, more about it than he did. So I wasn't very impressed. And to this meeting, I'm not very impressed yet. Um, I'm hoping that the, that the council and the mayor will have some kind of a resolution to do something legally about this. Because as I see, and as some of you people see, that the only thing we've got so far is nothing. And to waiting three months or two years, or whatever it's gonna take the FAA to decide what they're gonna do, what are you getting then? You're having people move out of these districts already. If you go to next door or one of the neighborhood districts, you will see people are already getting real estate agents in line because they're afraid nothing is gonna be done and they don't wanna be the last man out. So you're gonna have a bunch of places that are rental property, not historic districts. These people, up until recently, they didn't even admit to the fact that these things were flying over houses. They said that they were flying over the Grand Avenue corridor. I live a mile and a half from Grand Avenue and they're flying over my house constantly. Every 20 seconds, about 15 hours a day when the wind is going the right direction. And they're going to one o'clock in the morning on Sundays. The, we need a resolution and we need it today. Not next year, not next month. We need a resolution to do something about this. If it's legally, it needs to be done. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. President. I want to make sure I just respond to that real quick and say uh, that I, I think you've heard, at least what I heard, is a resolve from this council that uh, they want to get to the right resolution, that the status quo is not acceptable. In terms of legal action, we'd have to go through an executive session. So That's fine. I just want to make it clear that would not be an appropriate well, What I've heard so far today, today is nothing. I, I appreciate that very much, and I, re I appreciate your frustration. I just want to make it clear that uh, I heard very strong resolve from this council that the status quo is not acceptable, but legal action would have to be done through that's fine. what's called an executive session. I but appreciate that's that what needs to Thank be you. done. That's what needs to be done. Thank you so much. Mr. Conrad, good to see you. Followed by uh, Tim Moser, followed by Brent Kleinman. Mayor and Council, my name is Don Conrad. I live at 1621 Palmcroft Way Southeast. I've lived in downtown historic neighborhoods for 31 years, and I've been involved in a lot of fights to preserve and improve uh, the conditions in the downtown neighborhoods over that 31 years. In my estimation, this is the greatest threat to the viability of our historic neighborhoods since uh, the 80s when certain members of our community, and particularly members of the Planning Commission, thought that we ought to have high-rise zoning from Grant to Camelback from 7th Street to 7th Avenue. That's how serious I view this. I am pleased that the aviation staff has decided to um, ask the council for approval of a federal agenda, I think it's referred to in the report that was filed with the council, in order to enter discussions with the FAA, but I want to suggest that there are certain things that ought to be priority within that agenda. Okay. One is that these lobbyists, our lobbyists, need to try to convince the FAA or convince those that otherwise might convince the FAA that in this case the juice is just not worth the squeeze. The shifting of the cost from the airlines to the residents of these historic neighborhoods is unwarranted, it's unfair. It, it, there is no logical justification to be found in safety or fuel economy that would justify these changes. I want to convince the FAA, and based on comments that have been noted by a number of the members of the council, it would seem that do-overs are uh, warranted here. Um, everybody has some um, I'm, I'm lost my phrase, but everybody's guilty, perhaps, of some miscommunication or failure. Let's ask for do-overs on both sides, because what needs to be done is we need to have an immediate return to what was. We need to go back to the status quo, and I find it completely illogical to think that it might take just as long to return to what was when that was good enough for 25 years, at least 25 years. I also want to make the point, Mayor, that lest, any, lest anyone think that this is just a bunch of whining from upper middle class and middle class citizens that happen to live downtown, I urge them to take a few minutes on a day when these departures are towards the west and visit the Woodland or the Oakland neighborhood, where I went just a couple of hours before this meeting convened today. 
I went to the porch and saw a gentleman on the, on the front porch of his house and asked him about the increased noise, and he agreed the, no, there was an increase in noise. But he said, the thing that's worse for me is it wakes me up in the middle of the night. So when our lobbyists go and talk to the FAA, FAA or to whomever they talk to, I think you ought to think about that gentleman, or they ought to think about that gentleman. And in the end, remember the lessons of history here in Phoenix. Things can turn very rapidly here. For those that are students of Phoenix history, think of what happened, I believe, the late 50s, early 60s, how quickly our downtown went from a vibrant area to a ghost town. And think of all the money that we have, have committed from our government and from the individuals in downtown that will be lost if, um, if we don't turn this around. And in the end, I ask, when it comes to making a deal, don't betray us with an unwarranted compromise. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Conrad. Tim Moser is next, followed by Brent Kleinman, followed by P.J. Snyder. Thank you, Mayor Stanton. Thank you, Council. I'd like to, uh, in particular, thank uh, Laura Pastor, because my comments would not be uh, possible without her assistance in prying the uh, FAA reports away from the FAA when they refuse to provide any of the reports to the public after several requests. Um, FAA is required to do a number of things. One is they have a whole uh, body of regulations regarding environmental impact. None of them followed. In there it says the FAA official shall provide an opportunity for the local officials to review and comment on all federal actions affecting them did not happen. In fact, on September of 2013, the question in the FAA's internal files, which I would have hoped that Mr. Martin would have read before he came here, because I was sitting out here, I was able to answer every question by Laura Pastor and the other council members just by looking at the FAA's own documents. He wasted our time giving us gibberish when in their own files the answers are there. The question, are local citizens and community leaders aware, aware of the proposed project? No. That was signed in 2013, which was then reaffirmed on the eve of the adoption of the change. Again, they did not follow the procedures. The Arizona State Historic Preservation Officer Concurrence, Office Concurrence was a requirement for them to change the flight path. If they didn't get the concurrence, no change. Let me read what they told them. The proposed action is determined not to disrupt conversation and is no louder than the background noise of a commercial area. In the report to support that, they say, well, sure, it's going to be jets, but prop airplanes fly this other path Therefore, there won't be any added noise. The state preservation has withdrawn it because they now know that they were misled and provided false information by the FAA. What does that mean? That means that the flight path is illegal, pure and simple. FAA did not follow the procedures, did not follow the legal requirements. They have no right to continue to comply or enforce a flight path that was illegally adopted. Again, thank you very thank much. You very much. Uh, Councilman Pastor, thank you, uh, for Mr. Moser. Very, very uh, uh, well stated. I just want on that last point. Uh, the, obviously, the categorical exclusion when Congress allowed there not to be public hearings and allowed for categorical exclusion, they had to check off certain things. And what he's say, suggesting is that at least with SHPO and others, the checklist uh, may not have been uh, appropriate. So that's a very, very important legal um, issue. Brent Kleiman, and then followed by P.J. Snyder, followed by uh, A. Jones. Good afternoon. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and the City Council members. I want to first commend the city council members who have brought up the idea of litigation. I believe we could stay here till midnight discussing what has happened over the past few years and we will end up in the same place we are right now. We have to look and say as a city that the council and the mayor represents us and will take the appropriate legal action. I think the communities, the leaders of the communities that have worked with the mayor so far and the city council members, that's commendable. I want to make sure all the voices are heard of the residents of the affected areas and that the city council and the mayor 
are taking the lead and the attorneys for the city are taking the lead on this and not necessarily following residents but doing their own due diligence and research to determine what the best method moving yeah. forward is. That's why we have elected you as officers. That's why we entrust you in this. It's our job to assist, but not to okay. lead the city council and mayor along. And I just wanna also bring up at the end, the property values and the tax revenue that those property values generate to the city of Phoenix. I know the city of Phoenix has budget issues and can only imagine if you're taking some of the most valuable homes in Phoenix and deducting their value by 35 to 50 percent, what that decrease in property tax revenue is going to mean when you're trying to do a budget two years from now. I right, think uh, thank you very much. I want to make sure it's clear I, again what I heard and I believe is that I don't think this council in any way lacks the resolve to engage in litigation. We just want to make sure we're we want the right strategy to get the result that we all that we all want that the status quo is not acceptable. PJ Snyder is next followed by A Jones followed by Tim Caldwell. Up to two minutes, and again, if your point's already been made, uh, feel free to keep it short. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mayor, City Council members. I would like to address uh, the FAA representative. You mentioned earlier today that safety is your biggest concern. Well, it's a big concern of mine, too. Uh, I happen to own and manage probably the largest private arboretum in the city of Phoenix. I'm north of Grand Avenue. I have beautiful salt cedars that are over 100 years old. They attract thousands of honeybees each year. I have citrus. I have several species of giant cactus, and they're not doing too well. On any day, I can go out and find dead songbirds laying in my yard, which reside in the beautiful, magnificent trees. I can find puddles of honeybees just laying there dead. I want to know why the quality of life has not been mentioned yet today, sir, since safety is your greatest priority. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Snyder. A. Jones is next, followed by Tim Caldwell, followed by John Sossaman. Sockerman, I, Sockerman, I apologize if I mispronounced. Please, good Hello, to see Councilman. you. Councilman. Up to two minutes. My concern has to do with CAS over here, where the planes are actually banking over our heads at about 250 feet above the ground. That's too low. They, they spill fuel. It lands on us, okay? I literally had it land in my own hair, went like this thinking it was a bird or something dumped on me again. No, it was airplane fuel. Okay, the reason I know it was fuel it's because my dad was an aerial photographer. I spent a lot of time in Lear jets and stuff. So I know airplane fuel when I smell it. They're literally banking over the head right over here on 12th downtown. Yep. Okay? At very low range. Way too low to be flying over a city. Something needs to be done there. That's environmentally wrong. You know, I've come from Anchorage, Alaska where the environment is our number one thing that we concerned about. Thank you very much for your testimony. Thank you for coming, Mr. Jones. Think about very that. much appreciated. Tim Caldwell is next, followed by John Sockerman, followed by Susan Edwards. Thank you for the time to speak. Uh, thank you for Ms. Pastor and Norkowski, and especially uh, Ms. Gallego. Uh, until today, I never heard anybody mention South Phoenix and Levine until today. It is a real problem. There are a lot of new homes. There are thousands, perhaps tens of thousands of people that are impacted by this. The FAA answers today mean nothing to me. Please, Council and Mr. Mayor, make something happen, please. Thank you very much. I can just, uh, having worked with Councilman Nowakowski, uh, Councilwoman uh, Gallego and Pastor regularly, they mention South Phoenix and Levine multiple times per day. So I, we hear it a lot. So I, I, uh, John Sockerman uh, is next, followed by Susan Edwards, followed by Kathy Reifschneider. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Council. Uh, John Sackleman, uh, 121 North 11th Avenue, Phoenix, in the Woodland Historic District. And I just want to echo the idea that being south of Grand Avenue should not exclude us from 
the consideration. I know that a lot of the voices come from north of Grand Avenue, um, where um, they are they are experiencing a huge impact, but our impact is even greater. And the idea of a compromise, a compromise that would not take us back necessarily to where we were before, um, I'm afraid that our neighborhood's going to get thrown under the bus. That uh, when I hear other neighborhoods saying, we can, we can work this out, we can collaborate, we can, we can play nice, um, I'm not convinced. I'm not convinced that that's going to work. Uh, in my neighborhood, which I think is the hardest hit, um, the planes come over, uh, I don't know how often, every 60, 90 seconds sometimes, and over the course of the last 15 years, I have dealt with drug dealers, I've dealt with prostitutes, I've dealt with trash dumped in the alley. I've been here many, many times. I've participated in a lot of downtown organizations, but this is the only thing that's made me call my realtor and say, I'm not sure that I can keep doing this. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, Ms. Edwards is next, followed by Rith, Ms. Rothschneider, followed by uh, Mark Hodges. Susan Edwards, 1145 West Edgemont Avenue. That is at 13th Avenue or block in a block south of Thomas. I bought my house in 1984, and by my calculations, and I've spent a lot renovating it, um, I am probably now upside down <laughs> after 30 years, 31 almost. Um, and it's a beautiful house. We have the best neighbors you could ask for on the planet. Um, but the question that has not, that I did not hear Mr. Martin answer was about the stinking helicopters. When I bought my house, the washer and dryer were in the garage. So when the police helicopter was overhead, I didn't go to the washer and dryer because I lived by myself. Now, thank God I moved the washer and dryer into the house because the helicopters are overhead all the time. We're used to helicopters for St. Joseph's. We're used to a police helicopter at the park because of back up to the golf course. But there are way more helicopters and it's like they're barely over treetop. It's louder and it, I didn't hear you an answer to that. I missed a lot of your answers. I couldn't quite comprehend your answers. Um, and, but I didn't hear an answer to the helicopter issue, which is there are more of them, and they're lower, and they're noisier. And the flights are in the night because I have dual pane windows. And at 2.30 in the morning, wham, wham, the planes are going overhead. It makes me, you know, I, I don't want to leave my neighbors because I love them. I don't want to leave my house because I love it. But it's very discouraging. It's very discouraging to have spent a lot of money to be in a historic area, to, to improve that historic area, to work in the neighborhood, and then be slammed by basically, ugh, you can't get away from it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Edwards. Mayor. Councilman, please. I'd like to have an answer to that, because recently we've been getting a lot of complaints about helicopter noise and especially in, in the downtown area and also around the Grand, Air, Grand Avenue area. Has there been an increase or? Yeah. or yeah. I was asking our <laughs> city staff. Or so the question uh, that uh, was asked earlier was not, into, not only about the large uh, uh, airline airplanes, but also about smaller aircraft and helicopters and it's uh, how, how the FAA has taken that into consideration when they made these new uh, uh, departures. And now, has the helicopters, are they flying lower now flying lower. than before? Because yeah. that's what yes. we're hearing a lot of complaints that the noise of the helicopters that it seems like they're flying lower. I'm not sure because of the new path or, or what's the cause of that? Uh, Mayor and Councilman Nowakowski, um, we can certainly look at the radar data that we have and do an analysis to see if there's a change, but I would defer to um, Glenn Martin to see to answer if the new procedures are in some way related to a change in flight procedures for um, helicopters. The new procedures that I think are causing the greatest concern really would have nothing to do with the helicopters. There are specific departure procedures for high-performance aircraft off of the Phoenix Airport specifically. Uh, in many cases, your smaller aircraft or your helicopters are going to be operating under visual flight rules, meaning that they're not being directed or given any direction or altitude from air traffic control. So if there is a 
obviously concern raised that it, the volume is greater or that helicopters are lower would be something that we would look at, but we weren't looking at that around these procedural changes. That wasn't something we were studying because these changes did not have any effect on them per se because they were directed specifically at the departures off Phoenix. Thank you very much. Um, we'll, we'll go to the next speaker. Uh, I'm going to step away and hand the uh, chair in the meeting over to uh, Councilman Gates. I will be appearing telephonically, so I'll hear all of the testimony that's going on and have the opportunity to vote whatever motion. I do know that whatever motion is made here tonight is not in any way intended to be a comprehensive solution. It's just the immediate next step on the path. And at the request of many council members and my own direction, uh, this will be, uh, this item will be on the next uh, executive, excuse me, the executive session of the council uh, to discuss with our lawyers uh, some of the legal uh, issues that have been uh, brought over tonight and brought to our attention um, uh, as well. So I'm going to hand the chair of the meeting over to uh, Councilman Gates. Kathy Rashneider, you are the next uh, speaker up to two minutes. 26 years in Encanto Estates, which is about a half mile from Grand Avenue. I planned on retiring there, but now, like others, I'm thinking about moving. Um, I knew about I-17 when I bought. I knew about the State Fair when I bought. I knew about the trains. I anticipated that. I deal with that. But having this change in the airlines is is not an easy a thing to deal with. Every I got home uh, from a trip Friday night, opened my windows at nine o'clock, and every five minutes, every five minutes, a plane went over my my home. Um, Ms. Fisher, you made the comment that everyone was called. I was not called. Um, Mr. Martin, you made I felt like you made uh, the Super Bowl a threat. The city of Phoenix has had the Super Bowl before. So don't use, you want to give us a nice Super Bowl that's safe when we've had it before. Thank you very much. Next speaker, Mark Hodges. Looks like Mr. Hodges oh, is- Vice Mayor? Yes. I do want to ask a question to the staff. Where'd this whole Super Bowl issue come up? I mean, this is the first I've heard of it. And I find it bothersome because everything now, every change that's occurred is blaming it on the Super Bowl. Where'd this come up with the Super Bowl? I mean, how does that make, how does the FAA then make a determination we're doing this for the Super Bowl? I mean, it's just insane. Councilman DeCicio, I believe what Mr. Martin might have been referring to is the availability of resources within the local air traffic control team to conduct this analysis and, it, and evaluate the feasibility of changing the procedures and the impacts that that would have um, for the Super Bowl and also for the other bowl games and the Pro Bowl, there will be a significant amount of additional traffic coming to the Valley that has to be managed uh, by the lo local air traffic controllers, not only at Sky Harbor, but at all of the Valley airports. So um, they are resource constrained in terms of the expertise and staff resources to do this work and need to focus on uh, the safe air navigation of all the uh, additional traffic that's coming to the Valley for these big events. So to be clear, this wasn't changed for the Super Bowl, it wasn't put together for the Super Bowl, but in order any changes to be made because of the staff time, it's all about staffing time, is that correct? in order to make the changes. I would defer to Mr. Martin to answer that question, but that's my understanding of, of the point that he was trying to make. Mr. Martin? Some of the folks that need to be involved in analyzing the changes that we may be able to make are impacted by the Super Bowl from their availability standpoint. That's, that's okay. the simple point So it's, there. this was not changed for the Super Bowl? The, these the procedures, pattern. right? No, but others were. We did implement other procedures in order to establish uh, separation from a lot of the, the Super Bowl. Really affects a multitude of airports in the area. The people that fly in, especially in the uh, higher performance private aviation, fly into a multitude of airports. So we have gone out and put in certain procedures to deconflict those departures in order to increase But those the procedures are going to change back to the way they were, correct? Uh, I don't believe so. So can we also, at some point, other than the meeting tonight, get an outline of what those procedures were that cha were changed for the Super Bowl that are not going to change back? So at least we know what we're talking about. Certainly. 
And then, you know, I think there isn't anybody here that doesn't want this to be safe. I mean, everyone believes that safety is the first priority. But, you know, I don't think you've really made the case that it was not safe before, which I think you need to be able to do. Thanks. Thank you, Councilman. Um, I'm going to call out three names so we can kind of have people line up here and move through this. Dale Taylor, Roseanne Hurd, and Brian Almond. And if anyone from Fairview in the neighborhoods near there comes up, I would love it if you could address in your comments if the changes to the early turn have impacted the situation. My sense is from my email, it has not, but it would be wonderful if someone could speak to that. Thank you. Mr. Taylor? Yes, uh, Dale Taylor, 2116 West Windsor. And um, I would like to uh, address uh, something that Laura brought up earlier, and that is the windows in the older homes in Phoenix. Well, in anticipation of the noise problems, well, not really anticipating, but knowing, I had dual window panes put in our home, and our home has many large windows. I'm talking 48 square feet, 36 square feet, etc. Those windows, those dual pane windows, and the existing windows together do not get a, rid of any of that noise from the aircraft. And like other people have said, we are disturbed every day and every night from the aircraft going right over our homes. And uh, by the way, it cost about $8,000 to put windows into a home, but I upgraded, got the heavier glass, so it was only 10,000. That's just a little simple thing to throw in. Um, other than that, um, the uh, charts that they have been uh, showing us on the uh, screen, uh, number 12 in particular, we live far to the east of that green line. And uh, we also have a hard time speaking to our neighbors. We used to be able to talk from our yard across the street, say hi, how's everything going? Now it's talk to you later because we can't hear each other. This is a practical matter. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Ms. Hurd? Thank you. Roseanne Hurd, 2402 North 19th Drive. For almost 30 years, I've lived on the corner of 19th Drive and Lewis. It's less than a half a mile from Grand Avenue. No, Grand Avenue is not industrial, number one. I'm awakened like everybody else, midnight, 1 a.m. I'm a home-based business. 12.30 today, a propeller plane was going over my house so low, it sounded like it was landing in my backyard. I couldn't hear myself think. I have a suggestion. Mr. Martin, I have a spare bedroom. If you would come and move in with me, I bet that this whole procedure would be changed in a lot less than 90 days. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and uh, Mr. Allman, then can we have Andy Smithers, uh, Nicole, and Ron Marquez, please? Um, <clears throat> my name's Brad Almond. I'm a resident of, of Fairview. Um, no, we did not, uh, in my opinion, uh, feel any, uh, perceive any noise improvement. Uh, on the other hand, the FAA has a, you know, <clears throat> a responsibility to work with the neighborhood, and every time we work with them, then they can go to, and, and in court or in Congress, say, look, we worked with the neighbors, okay? So they have, <clears throat> so no, in my opinion, there was no ch improvement. Um, first, this isn't an accident, okay? This, <coughs> the planes that started flying over, um, Congress is doing this for a very specific reason, okay? It's not an accident, and it's not the FAA. The FAA is following its orders. Um, <coughs> the FAA and the airport have both, they have to be aware of what's happening because it's, <coughs> um, it's been a process that's been going on legally for decades. <coughs> um, 
with regard to the CADEX, for example, the CADEX categorical exclusion is a <coughs> way of expediting environmental impact studies. So instead of doing a full environmental impact study, they have an abbreviated way of processing dozens of airports, okay? And <coughs> um, so Congress told the FAA to do it that way. And the CADEX, the categorical exclusions, <sighs> for first there's a review process, and part of the review process is contacting the State Historic Preservation uh, Society to make sure that there's no impacts. But the impacts they're talking about are <coughs> um, impacts that of uh, to probably if you could wrap up your your thought, your time is up. The there was a beep that went off, so again, still have several more people to speak. Thank you, Mr. Smithers. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, just one observation, which nobody in this room has brought up as well, has been um, other cities, and in addition to the, us being the 30th of the other 29 in this uh, position, many cities across the United States have had next-gen rollouts with a big uh-oh, and uh, a lot of those cities are fighting this, and I'm not sure if they have another representative to speak to the issues for all of the other 30 cities or, or 29 cities around the United States that are having some rollout issues with NextGen as well. My question to the FAA is, if this was a security or a safety issue at which they were going to redirect these planes in a safely, safe manner, in the event of an accident, would not any plane that would go down in these heavily populated, densely populated neighborhoods of Phoenix, wouldn't that create a bigger safety concern in the event of an emergency situation? When the air traffic was going over the river valley, certainly I think we minimized that because there were smaller population areas to be affected. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Nicole Marquez. I live at 9th Avenue and Portland Street. I live in FQ Story. Um, first of all, I'd like to echo what uh, Mr. Kleiman, Brent Kleiman, had suggested um, with the taking over of some serious issues on behalf of the citizens of Phoenix, Arizona. A lot of neighborhoods um, do not feel that they're being completely represented. Um, I'd just like to paraphrase um, a few articles that I have sent to the council and also Mayor Stanton, um, first of all, I'd like to thank everybody for being here and assembling this organ or this team to talk about this, and especially to the FAA for thank you for being here. I know it kind of seems like you're kind of the whipping boy at this point, and um, the fact that you're at the table is kind of a big deal anyway, so thank you very much for that. Um, we need relief. Um, although we have been asked to wait, we can't sleep. Our lives have been affected uh, tremendously. I know you don't care about my cat, but I do. And every time these planes fly over, he hides in the closet. Um, not exactly ideal. Um, people need to sleep. My husband works for the United States Air Force. Um, it's very important that he does his job in making sure that you people are safe. And he can't do that if he can't sleep either. Um, one thing I would like to say that we've made suggestions to the council, um, and also Simon um, Wheaton Smith has also come to you with the suggestions. But these are relatively new suggestions that we've come up with. So one <clears throat> is possible noise ordinances um, for quiet noises throughout um, Phoenix. The second is an injunction against the implementation of PBN for outbound flights. The third is soundproofing our affected homes. Another thing I wanted to discuss is the, f the actual flight path for inbound on inbound flights. Um, prior to December or uh, September 18th, we did not experience, and I live south of the freeway, just so you all know, um, we did not experience the incoming traffic with the sound levels. Currently, regardless of whether you're coming and going, we're still being vibrated to death south of the freeway. So I just wanted to include that. So okay. thank you, you for your time. Thank you very much. Uh, 
and then if we can have Brandon Roush, Nicholas Crump, and Allison Manley or Marley come join us. Mr. Marquez, thank you for your service. Oh, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Council. Um, thank you to my fellow community members uh, for all your support. Uh, Mr. Martin, I actually want to thank you for coming out tonight, um, and I want to apologize for the last meeting. Uh, that last meeting, uh, you faced some uh, pretty aggressive folks here in the crowd, uh, but we didn't really understand uh, that uh, the city had been notified in a few different uh, ways. Um, so I encourage you, if uh, there's anybody to be thrown under the bus, uh, provide some documentation, uh, because we really want to know how it went down. Uh, if we'd have seen this slideshow, that first meeting, which by all rights, uh, everybody associated with it should have understood uh, what the plan was is. And believe me, over the last two months, everybody sitting in this audience has become an expert on what all these little squiggles mean. Uh, I d initially, I, d I scoffed at the idea of additional education and community outreach. Um, as I said before, we're pretty much experts out here. Um, however, after a little bit of thinking, all that's really going to do is uh, bring more of the community into this room. So uh, with that being said, Mr. Martin, uh, you still have the time to be the hero in this situation. Um, you can go back and find us a solution. Uh, honestly, the next time I see you, I'd like to have a line in the sand and say, this is what's going to happen, and this is when, and this will work. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Rauch? Hi. So my name is Brandon Roush, and I actually rent in FQ Story, so I don't live here, um, as in I don't own a home. And that sometimes comes up, you know, those that rent, those that are not uh, residents and paying property taxes. I can assure you that the landlord, landlord that I have that I've had for five years pays his property taxes, and so I, I sit and get to hear these planes roaring overhead. In those five years that I've been here, I've heard all kinds of noise. I hear the trains, I hear helicopters. I, I'm pretty used to that. You know, was, you almost get immune to it, right? These are a little difficult to get used to. The planes tearing overhead, uh, the droning, the, I don't know if it's a frequency, I'm not a scientist, but I do know that it is troublesome to hear and it doesn't seem to be getting any better. Uh, one of the things that comes up is, what do we do to see these or hear them? Uh, a group of us have started putting these on YouTube. There is some power in social media and we think we have about 12 to 15 videos right now. If you go and you search and type in d.fact, um, and Nicole, what was the last part of it? It's d.fact, video manager. If you type in those words right now, you should be able to find it. So d, I know it's a little confusing, dot, as in the dot, fact, and then video manager. You can see some of those. Um, council members, you might have already been forwarded some of them, but if you'd like to take a look, we've also opened it up and we can load any that you have as well. So you'll have lots of data from, from a level there uh, to look at. I would also encourage, and this is the last thing I'll say, is to get some kind of uh, commitment that the sound studies will be done in some of the areas that we've discussed here today, uh, as opposed to just saying blanket. You know, I've been going online and doing my complaints pretty uh, diligently as they come over. I couldn't keep up if I tried, but uh, on, on the Phoenix Sky Harbor website, but I would have definitely encourage the sound studies to occur at a local level. That's all I have. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Ms. Marley, come on down. Hi, I'm Allison Marley. I actually live in District 2 in North Phoenix. I live near 64th Street and Bell. And after seeing that, I understand what the gentleman at the noise complaint line has told me when he said they dropped a green line over your home. We have inbound planes, and I've come to learn that the noise we hear is called air braking when they start to slow down as they're approaching the home. This is one after another after another. I also work at home, so I hear it all day. It gets worse at dinner time and at bedtime. We've taken steps, you mentioned windows. We put in the noise mitigation windows, we lucked out. We got a contractor referred to us by Sky Harbor who had two windows that actually fit our home. These are expensive windows. They're double pane, a space, and a single pane. We still hear the noise. I mean, my greatest sympathy to everybody who's in the historic district who has it worse than we do, but I feel like also our area is definitely being overlooked, and there's areas where you want to go outside and go hiking and biking and enjoy our great weather, and you just can't anymore. You can't get away from the airplanes. It's, it's sad, so I hope that all areas of Phoenix get addressed. 
and not just exclude to the Grand Avenue Historic District. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Nicholas, these are our last three speakers, Nicholas LaFranz, Michael March, and Steve Drzowski. Uh, thank you, Mayor and Council. Uh, thank you also, Mr. Martin, for being brave enough to come down here. I live in the Fairview Place neighborhood. I have been there since 1986. In your name for the record? Oh, Nicholas LaFranz. Thank you. Sorry. Um, I'm a professional engineer by trade. I've participated in a lot of environmental impact statements for transportation projects, some of which were quite unpopular projects. One thing I've realized, one thing that needs to be pointed out here is that these types of studies cannot be done in a vacuum. If you do it in a vacuum, this is what you end up with be because concerns are not addressed in advance. They're trying to be addressed after the fact and it ain't the way to do it. Um, one thing I also wanted to mention, from the city's perspective uh, at skyharbor.com, you have a link to what's called your noise envelope mapping report, which I believe was issued in June of this year which ostensibly has updates to noise envelope mapping through 2018. That report makes no mention of next gen. It does not address these flight path alterations. It, it's kind of odd because it's over 500 pages, probably cost well into six figures to produce by a consultant from Cincinnati, Ohio, and it says nothing about this. There's a, there's a void, there's a vacuum associated with that and there were definitely issues with this process. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Michael March, and then I'm gonna have to join on the phone as well, and I'll be turning it over to Councilor Nowakowski. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Hello, can you hear? Um, I'm Mike March, and I live in Encanto Palmcroft, uh, 1133 West Holly. Um, and there's nothing groundbreaking here. I figure we're gonna be at a lot of these meetings. Well, hopefully not a lot, but so just a little update from the ground. Um, first of all, uh, I personally and everyone I know is very disappointed in the FAA's first response that was published last month. I know everyone in the council and everyone else who is official had to be nice and say, we appreciate you responding and dealing with us and everyone had to play nice, but I think most people would have rather you guys not respond and just say, go screw off instead of what you guys published because it answered a question that we didn't ask or say what, what was a problem. Everyone's very clear about what the problem was and it didn't address that, so that's the first thing. Um, and uh, it's been 89 days since this started and you know, I was thinking at first, maybe I'll get used to it and that is, is getting, it, it, it grates on me more. It, it's um, just the other day, I was helping pass out flyers to hundreds of houses hundreds of houses uh, to say where to call and email for this issue. And it was so loud, I think it was like, make me walk faster and get angry that it was, it was insane. Finally, today, right before this meeting, I had a call to do uh, for, my, uh, for the company that I work for. And we're on a conference call and I said, excuse me, I'm gonna have to break out early to go into a meeting with the FAA and the, and the Phoenix City Council. Uh, for uh, fl uh, planes are planes. Planes are being routed over my house. I'm like, okay, and partly during the call it was so loud because I'm outside walking here. They're like, they said, "quote Dude, you better get in that meeting. I can't even hear you." So this is a call with Direct TV trying to do business with Arizona, and they're like, just perplexed that this is that it's like we're in a war zone. So that's it. Thank you so much. Thank you, and we got Stu. Steve Drukowski, is it? Thank you, Steve. Uh, members of the City Council, my name is Steve Dreisison. I want to thank you very much for taking this item up today. This is a big deal. We've been on this for 90 days now. I want to thank aviation staff for your help and support. I want to thank the FAA, Mr. Martin and uh, Mr. Grader for showing. Um, we've heard a lot today. We've heard a lot of new things from the last meeting, and we've heard some old things. Uh, there's an old saying, woulda, coulda, shoulda. If we all could do things differently today than we would have done before, we wouldn't have this problem. The pro point is, where do we go from here? You've heard suggestions of minor changes. You've heard suggestions of rolling things back. My friend Simon Wheaton-Smith has, has sent me a text. 
and he says, someone should say that the, since the old SIDS are still valid, there is no impediment to a rollback, they are still there. So I am hoping that we look at the full range of solutions here. We look at minor changes, um, early turns, and uh, uh, not flying procedures properly on Grand Avenue is not the problem on Grand Avenue. The flight path on Grand Avenue is the problem. That is one issue. We have a myriad of issues in our community. We have to look at a comprehensive solution. I thank you all for your time. Thank you, Steve. And I think that's all the cards, right? Yeah. What I'd like to do is I'd like to thank all those individuals that came and gave their testimony and, and your input. I'd like to thank Mr. Martin for coming down, our airport staff for being here and listening to the community. But also, I just want to remind our airport staff and also Mr. Martin, back in, 19, in the 1970s, we had an expansion of the airport and a new path route, and it, we basically moved about 6,000 families from the neighborhoods around the airport, and that affected four Hispanic neighborhoods, and now they're spread out throughout the city of Phoenix, and now we have vacant um, properties with around this airport. We have um, um, Council Member Gallegos that's tr trying to figure out a way to do something with that empty property, but right now it seems like a ghost town out there. The only thing we have standing is the old Sacred Heart Church that's a historic building. And we, as a council member, I, I sure don't want to see that happen within the downtown area or within South or West Phoenix. I believe that what you're hearing here is that it's having the planes on that lower route that's really affecting the, the old path, even in the Levine area in South Phoenix, you're, you're hearing more of the aircrafts because of the height of the planes. And I think that what I'm hearing out loud is that we need to return back to that old route where we're actually having airplanes ascend into the air faster and that the noise levels are, are different at that time. At this time, I would like to, to give some direction to, to our staff and, um, and make a motion, and I would like to make a motion to direct staff, city staff, to inform the FAA that we recommend to go back to the old flight path and the old flight procedure. This is directed to require this of the city of Phoenix and that uh, we do whatever it takes to defend our, our policy. That's a motion, I'm not sure if there's a second on that. And any discussion on that? Can I have friendly uh, add-ons to the motion or do we want to make a motion and then how do we want to do this? Basically what I'm trying to do here is give direction to the staff on what the, what the following uh, procedures should be and what type of messaging we should send to the FAA. So I, I, I would entertain maybe one motion. We can have several motions, okay. right? Go, go ahead. Is there any discussion on that motion? Are we getting the multiple motions or? I think so. Okay. Do you have a substitute motion? Well, it's a, a packaged motion, so I'll read it and then uh, we can discuss it or we can say it's a second, mo uh, different. So. Um, Unless you want to vote on this motion, this passes and we introduce a second motion also. Can we do that? Dan. Uh, uh, Council Member Nowakowski, yes. Uh, you can go ahead and vote on the motion that's presently on the floor, and then you can go ahead and, and submit another motion afterwards. All right, so we have a motion, we have a second. Any discussion on that motion? Hey, Council, this is uh, Mayor Stanton. Yes, Mayor. Can you hear me okay? We can hear you loud and clear. The intent is to say that it is our policy to ask staff to, as they work with the FDA, to make it our goal to go back to uh, the original flight, uh, the original departure path. Is that correct? Correct. And procedures, okay. right. Thank you. Mayor, I think it's more direct than that. I mean, I think it was more like this is what we're going to insist that the FAA go back to the original flight and that the city of Phoenix is going to defend everything it needs to do to defend that policy. That's the way I heard it. Does anyone hear it differently? Okay. Correct. Okay. Yeah, Councilman, I, the, the 
motion is well taken by me. I just want to make sure I understand uh, what you're requesting. Okay. Well, it was more than just asking. It was like saying this is what the policy of the city of Phoenix is going to be. All right. We have any other discussions on that? With that, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion passes. At this time, we'll in, um, entertain another motion if there's one out there. So I move to accept the staff recommendation. Uh, I direct the city manager to request all documents related to the flight path changes at the Phoenix Sky Harbor Airport from FAA and that the city manager conduct a thorough review of how we got to this point. Uh, mitigation measures that are being considered should also include cargo traffic, helicopter traffic, Grand Avenue, and the Southwest departure routes. Second. All right, we have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Yeah, this is uh, Mayor Stanton. I think uh, the issue at the beginning on the disclosure of documents was not just our request of the FAA, but also uh, that our, it would be the policy that we disclose uh, all documents that are held within uh, City of Phoenix Aviation Department on this issue as, uh, as well. I think it's fair that uh, everyone involved disclose all documents. I think that point was well made by uh, Councilman DeCicio. So both parties. I'll add that both, both with right. both um, FAA and uh, Sky Harbor Aviation. All documents, right? Mm -hmm. Correctly. Any discussion? So with that, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. Is there any other motions or direction? Only to note that, uh, as was mentioned, this is going to be uh, on our next executive session to have a more uh, uh, an appropriate conversation with our attorneys. You know what? There's one other comment. There's a third. Hold on. Moving forward. So that's multiple motions that are out there. Uh, the motion would be to direct staff um, and to work with the FAA in the future to make sure that this never happens again, that you end up getting no different than you would when you go through, um, you know, when the city of Phoenix does the, the policy agenda for the legislative agendas for the federal and the state, that the, once the FAA has informed city staff, that puts the onus back on us on the political side of it, once they've informed the city staff that there's going to be a change that you have got to come to the council for council direction before you start negotiating and working with the FAA. So that then requires city, requ uh, city council approval of the next direction of whether or not this is going to happen again. So this helps you in the FAA, helps the city staff, and it lets the public know that this council is aware of what's going on and we notify, and we can notify the, prop uh, the proper uh, individuals and the, and the uh, neighborhood leaders. We need a second or you yeah, we need a second on that. Second. So basically just some clarification. So basically if there's any changes or our procedures that are gonna be changed by the FAA, that city staff has thirty days to bring it to our attention and to get approval, right? Yeah, and it's a thirty day request, that's right. And if there's any if it's a draft or whatever it is, that they still need to bring it to us, right? No different than we do the legislative agendas, where you have to bring that to us and get direction from the council. Okay. Any other clarifications or questions? I'm sorry, so that was for any changes to departures and arrivals, or? Could it would be any, any changes to the, uh, the, flight cha the flight path changes. Not departure and arrivals, but the flight path changes, the, one, the ones that have the impact, and even including if there's gonna be a height change as well. Any questions or discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion passes. Well, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for attending and the meeting's adjourned.